Hello everyone and welcome to the live stream. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and a member of PMDG's tech team. Today let's do a Ryanair Real Ops flying from Napoli to Genoa and thereafter hopefully back to Napoli if time permits since I will be uh, flying in real life later on today as well. Anyway, as always we are going to start with a quick look into our operational flight plan which we have available right over here. So, we are going from uh, Napoli to Genoa, we are on the Nine Hotel, Quebec Alpha Hotel, which is a Malta Air operated aircraft. Now, for those of you who are not too familiar with the Ryanair Group, they operate every aircraft based in Germany, France and Italy, with, their, um, with one of their um, group airlines, Malta Air, which can be identified with a small little sticker next to the air stairs up here next to the main door. And of course by the Maltese registration of the aircraft in the back. Now, those aircraft are pretty much, let's call it, the um, standard Ryanair um, aircraft with little to no modifications except that they are operating under a different air operator certificate. Now, if we continue with our flight plan, we are looking at generally very good weather here. Naples got wind from the east, few clouds, if at all. At least I can't spot. Oh, there's one. There's one. Okay. Few clouds, yep. That sort of makes sense. And um, our destination, Genoa, got light and variable winds, scattered clouds, wind 15010, and during the course of the afternoon, there's a little bit of rain forecast. Our alternate, Bergamo, is looking at generally good weather as well, so quick look into the no temps as well. And what we can see here is basically not a lot of really interesting information, if I'm totally honest. A couple of uh, taxiway closures every here and there. Let's see, runway, just a little bit of lighting and approach. ILS glide path 06 not available. Okay, that could become interesting when we come back to uh, Napoli later on, because that means we will have to fly the um, localizer approach most likely, or another non-precision approach. Then let's have a look into our alternate. We have presence of flock of birds, starlings on the maneuvering area that's fine for me de-icing not available well we're probably not gonna need that one today then looking at the runway no temps we have runway closure between 2300 and 0400 except for um helicopters scheduled and delayed flights available within 30 minutes okay one of the factors and something on the on off sits here speed limitations as follows We'll have to keep that in mind also for the return flight. And a quick look at our alternate, finally. New equipment on test, do not use, okay. Doesn't matter to us then. Apart from that, if I'm just quickly skipping over the stuff we see over here, uh, there's really not a lot of interesting stuff here. Something for the standard arrivals, minimum en route level along Luzo 3 Tango, race to level 150, okay. Doesn't really matter. So, all in all, good weather, good no times. The aircraft is technically in an okay condition as well. So, after all, I would load this one up with six tons of fuel and no need for any extra fuel. Alrighty. That basically concludes our look at the um, flight plan. So, let's go ahead then, jump into the airplane, and we can then start our flight. Here we are in the flight deck. Now, you can see I've done a little change to the panel stating that I reduced the fuel load a little bit and um, opened the air stair instead of the default. I mean, instead of the default um, stair that would have been connected. Apart from that, it's in the standard cold and dark state, so let's go ahead with our safety inspection and power the airplane up. As usual, normally we do the safety inspection while we are standing up in the plane over here. So um, that 
is the uh, normal position from which we would be doing this inspection. If you want to see the exact details of how we do it, I have published those um, in the tutorials on my channel. Also, I do have a new piece of hardware, which is the Honeycomb Bravo Throttle Quadrant, which I will be testing for the very first time on a live stream today. So, if you are interested in that one, stay tuned, and I am also going to give you a little bit of commentary on that one as we go along. But if I'm totally honest with you, I didn't even get to test it properly yet, so what you are going to see is the um, very first time that I'm actually using it. All that I've done was a little bit of configuration, so um, adding a flap lever and doing uh, that kind of stuff. Now, in a couple of uh, past live streams, I have been asked if I could do a flight from the first officer's seat. Now, I know that the vast majority of you prefers to sit on the captain's seat, so what we'll do today is we'll fly over to Genoa on the captain's seat, and then we'll return from the first officer's seat. So, testing the oxygen, make sure that you are running it in the uh, test 100% mode for a, certain, for a certain time as well to check that the um, needle up there is actually keeping the pressure to make sure there's nothing wrong with the pressure lines. Also, light test, finally for one of the first times in an actual live stream, I'm thinking of that. We're doing that in order to make sure that um, all the lights are working and talking about it. Looks like it's actually worth it. The pack lights are not illuminating right now. That is certainly not supposed to be. And in real life, we could just pop those lights out now. So you just kind of pull the light out, and then you can exchange the bulbs within the lights. There are two bulbs included in uh, every single light. So we would use that to just exchange the bulb. We have some spare bulbs available up here, and actually Exchanging light bulbs is the only maintenance action that pilots are permitted to carry out. And if the light would still not be working, that would be case to call engineering, because then there would be something wrong inside the uh, actual aircraft, and that would require actual maintenance action. For our flight simulator purposes, we'll just keep it at that. I'm going to file a bug report at the end of the live stream with PMDG, so that that one gets fixed. Right, next thing to do when you get on board the airplane as a captain is check the oil quantities, check the hydraulic quantities to make sure that they match, and then I'll just switch on the hydraulic pumps and the um, fuel pumps, and also put on the wheel well light and the uh, steady position light so that the colleague doing the walk around can actually see something inside the wheel well because it gets really dark there, even in daylight. And of course that the um, pilot is able to spot any leakages any easier. The other thing we'll do here, we'll call ourselves a fuel truck. I'm going to do the refueling using the PMDG services and not the uh, GSX services, because the PMDG services just work a lot nicer there in my opinion. Apart from that, we're going to do boarding through GSX. So at this moment the cabin crew will be carrying out their safety checks and as soon as those are completed, we would then go ahead and um, we would do the, um, or we would start the boarding. Alright, so, first of all, before I'm going to start with the rest of the setup now, hello everyone um, who's joined the stream. I can see the numbers of viewers is really building up, which I'm really grateful for because Flight Deck to Sim is doing a stream at the same time. So, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. And... Um, Mollus, yes, the tablet will be coming soon, but I can't give any more details than in the last update. Okay, so fuel trucks attaching. As soon as they're here, we're going to start the refueling, and then we'll also start our boarding straight away. Here we go. We're going to use GSX for the boarding because of the nicer effects. I've also downloaded a profile for... Um, Napoli Airport, so let's see how good that is actually boarding just about going to be. And we don't have Rhino handling available, that's unfortunate, but then we'll just take Menzies. 
because all the others I have bad experience with. I haven't tried Menzies yet, so probably... Let's see, maybe they bring us a little bit less delays. The stand here certainly looks like passengers could just be walking on the aircraft, so let's see how GSX is actually going to do that. Alright, so with that completed, it's time to start our FMC programming. I'll bring the operational flight plan back up on the screen for you, so let's go. First thing to check, of course, on the item page, we're in the correct model. We have the correct engine rating, enough data is up to date. Going on to the POS in it, we are in Lima, India, Romeo, November. Pilots, Pilots boarding starting. starting. We'll put that in the IRS position uh, from the GPS. Then route. We're going towards Lima, India, Mike, Juliet. And we are the Romeo, Inca, Romeo, 11, Lima. So, departure, if we just have another look at the weather, we can see it looks a lot like runway 06 today, so let's go for that, runway 06, and we are filed via Vexov, and let's say Vexov 7 Golf in here. Then Mike 729, Quebec 704. And that brings us towards Calmo. With a Calmo arrival for runway 28. Now, 28 is the easy runway in Genoa because they have an ILS approach available there. And we have Calmo 1 November. The other side is certainly more interesting. A little trick that I'm always using here is when I don't know where the star ends. I'm just going to the uh, right-hand FMC, and here we have it ending at G-code, so we're going to take G-code as a transition for arrival. Activate, but don't execute it, because we're going to do that later in the briefing. Cost in X6, you always have that one in Ryanair. Reserves 2.5, zero fuel, 59 tons is planned. And finally, we have a cruising altitude of flight level 300 planned. Cruise wind, 281 at 24. We always put the uh, top of climb wind in there, so um, don't be surprised about that one. Ice had deviation plus 1, so that's going to be minus 43 degrees then. And transition altitude, we'll actually have to look that one up in the charts. So if we have a look into those, let's quickly get our flight from uh, Navigraph. Now, on the last live stream, I've had a question there, which app I'm actually using for this, and it's just the standard Navigraph chart app. So, no fancy stuff there, just a standard Navigraph app. And here we have a transition altitude, 8,000 feet. So we're going to put 8,001 into the transition altitude. Outside temperature, if we're on it already, let's quickly put that one in as well. Life meter. Napoli, 119 uh, degrees. The real Ryanair aircraft um, require manual entry of the temperature in here, but that's just what it is. You can also do a little bit of descent preparation. Well, or not, it looks like... Ah, yeah, I noticed that one on my last live stream. The report is actually in already. Sorry for that, guys. Last thing we have to find out is our engine out sit. Now, as always, I told you, um, you can get very nice engine out sits from uh, Blackbox 711, and I am using SimToolkit Pro, where I have actually put that one in. So if we have a look at SimToolkit Pro here, in the settings down here, I inserted the link to... Um, I inserted the link down there, towards uh, the black box website and I've just called it airfield brief because that is what we call it in real life then we go on airport info and in here we have Lima India Romeo November and we get our briefing Romeo 06 at 4.40 me from Napoli so we'll put November Alpha Papa 
slash 4.4. And I'll just quickly attach this one to my monitor. So from there, left turn on track 178, intercept radial 340, in Mount Sierra Oscar Romeo at Gamma Hold. Okay, so we'll put 178 in here as a radial, and then Sierra Oscar Romeo. And we'll intercept 340 inbound, so we'll draw radial 340 in there. Okay, so. Just trying to understand how that's actually going to work. Oh, it's not going to work at all because I inserted the EO set for runway 24. Okay, that makes sense. So we're actually going to turn on track 2228. I guess he means 228. And when passing radial 353 Sierra Oscar Romeo, left turn to Gamma and hold. Okay, so 353. Three. How's that working? Both don't intersect. That's what's kind of wondering me right now. Because. Oh! Okay. Sorry. My apologies. I've kind of been looking into the direction of Romeo 24 and I was wondering if I turn that radial here, I'm never going to cross this. But actually, of course, if we go straight at until 4.4, then turn right onto 228, we're going to intersect this radial. And when we intersect this radial, we're going to turn towards Gamma. So let's put that in at the end of the Lex page. Gamma and... I've created a discontinuity above that. But this way we can you know, see on our... ND, where Gamma actually is. It's up here. Part of the standard set as well, it seems. So the engine out is going to take us straight out to here. Right turn 228. Across that mountain here. And when we pass this radio, we can turn left towards Gamma to pick up the hold. We can see how that's pretty much keeping us clear of the terrain that we have visible over here. Now the last thing we got to determine is how high are we actually going to climb. And um, on here we can see we have an MSA of 8,400 feet. Now, that climbing to 9,000 feet on a single engine would probably be pretty high. So, um, what we're going to do is we'll have a look at our charts and see if there is anything more specific covered. So, let's just take this one out again. And here we can actually see Gamma it's over the water. They have a 6,000 feet restriction here. That's probably to keep us clear of Mount Vesuvius at 4,200 and two feet, so let's climb a 6,000 feet if we have to. I'll just put that in here as a reminder. And that is kind of going to help us um, keeping clear of the uh, terrain. Okay. Then that's pretty much that part of the setup completed. Let's go ahead and do the remainder of our um, flight deck. Your damper on, nav transfer, display switch is normal auto, fuel pumps on, also test the cross feed. Everything got it in here and the power is on. Now our refueling, yeah, we have six tons on board, it's complete, so the seatbelts can go on. Window heat on, probe heat. Auto, anti ice off, relay hydraulic pumps on, voice recorder on, trimmer on. We'll see where the temperatures currently are. 32 degrees, that's quite warm. I'll put the APU on for a little bit of air conditioning. Packs going to auto, cruise level we set 300 is planned. And for our landing elevation, let's see, that's 63 feet. Always 50 feet higher in the FMC than the actual runway because we want to overfly the threshold at um, 50 feet. So 13 feet, so we can leave the land out at zero. We do have maintenance available, so ignition going to the right hand side. Flight director's on. Do we have any initial climb published? No, we don't. 
So let's just put it at 6,000 feet then as our first stop altitude. In real life you'd be getting it from ATC then. From my track, 054. Can put that in the heading already. And that might be a very good point to start searching for the other SID chart that we need. So... Rombi 06, on of initial climb, and let's also have a look at the conventional chart here. So straight at 055, they say in here, until 4.5 dmi from Napoli. Max 210 knots, then turn left, 208 degrees until 3000, and then left 160. Inbound Sierra Caromeo, so let's take 160 on the course. And thereafter, from Gamma, we are already take our right hand turn, and then it's all on off. So 160 on the courses, both sides. And that's pretty much this part. 1022, we said earlier on. So let's put that up here. Always a good idea to reset the fuel flow, by the way, just so that um, if somebody who's flown the plane before hasn't done it. Okay, fuel truck can go. Let's set up parking brake. Brake cooling is not going to be a factor. Flying on an Vatsum, so Unicom and the guard frequency. Let's see if we're going to hear any Francos on today's flight. If you don't know that one, you probably don't even want to know it. So, straight at to 4.5 dB from NAP, 10.59, uh, sorry, 10.95, of course. Then we'll need Sarano as well, which is on here, 12.2. I'm gonna switch that one active on my side. Okay, so that's pretty much the setup of the airplane completed. Alright, so that's the point where we could start our departure briefing now. So let's go ahead and do that. Our colleague should be back from the walk around. So are you ready for the departure briefing? Just quickly going to do his setup as well. Okay, threats for the departure. We do have some rather high terrain in the area, which we can see on our chart as well. We'll go straight ahead. There is terrain rising up 2,000 feet and even 5,000 feet over there. So um, we'll make sure that we carefully stick to the sit. We're also going to use the terrain display. And um, apart from that, make sure that we comply with those altitude restrictions. We do have an engine outset as well, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And apart from that, I would say that's uh, all the threats that we have for today. So let's go ahead and do a route check then. We're flying from Lima, India, Romeo, November, Lima, India, Mike, Juliet, Romeo, India, Romeo, 1, 1, Lima. And our routing is via Vexov, Mike, 729, Gilio, Quebec, 704, Calmo. And that's a ground distance of 411 miles versus 419. 3.1 tons of fuel remaining, and um, we need 2.5 for a diversion towards Bergamo. So the UTC time is 1154, altimeter 1022, reading 300 feet. MFRA will still have to be determined, but it's probably going to be something in the region of 1300 feet. So I'm just going to pre-select that for now. Flight directors are on, minus master, and the stamper instruments are set. Lefty takeoff, runway 06, flaps 5, noise abatement, departure number 2, and our uh, special engine outsets straight at 4.4 miles, right hand turn, 228, when crossing the radial from Serrano, turn direct to... Um, Gamma, and we said we uh, we want to climb to an altitude of 6,000 feet. 
that is going to keep us safe about the Mount Vesuvius as well. So, um, for the emergencies above 80 knots, I will only reject the takeoff for our fire. Fire warning, engine failure, predictive winter warning, aircraft unable, unsafe to fly. If I call stop, I will simultaneously close the thrust lever and disengage the auto throttle, apply max manual braking of fire operation of the RTO auto brakes. I will manually raise the speed brake lever, apply maximum reverse thrust, and when the aircraft comes to stop, I will set the parking brake. If you call stop, I will note the brakes on speed, close speed brakes up or speed brakes not up, and thrust reverse normal or abnormal indications. I'll call 100 knots, 8 knots, 6 knots, and the ROM distance remaining. Verify your actions, call in emissions, I will call auto brake disarm, and select FAB 40 when the parking brake has been set and advise ATC of the reject. We then identify the failure and carry out any drills as appropriate. If we decide to evacuate, we read and do the evacuation checklist. Time permits, I will pull the CBRCB, you grab the lid, and then we get out. Now, if the call before we want to keep going, there will be no actions below 400 feet except to cancel any warning to raise the landing gear with a positive rate of climb. 400 feet, drop our heading select, and carry out the memory items. At the MFRA, we'll buck up and reject the flaps and schedule. Flaps up no lights, select level change, MCT, engage the automatics, non normal checklist, normal checklist, and then we do PIOC in its PA, and then we'll basically decide. So, we are parking on the stand 18, so it's going to be a pushback onto Quebec, and then we'll go via Romeo. No, we won't, we, won't. we will simply go via Alpha. We'll take the Bravo figures though, just in case that uh, something blocks Alpha. So, for the routing, I'll quickly go over the conventional before we start with the um, FMC. So the conventional is straight at 4.5 DM Napoli, above 2,000 feet, maximum 210 knots. Turn left heading 208 until 3,000 feet and then left amount to Gamma. And from there we are going to join the Arna. Let's have a look at the ANAF chart now, which is on plate 10-3, effective 8th of September. And in the FMC we then have Rome 06 with the Vexus 7 Golf departure. Transition altitude 8000 versus 8001. Routing straight out to Vuno, max 210 above 2000 feet. And here we're going straight out to Vuno, 210 above 2000 feet. Left turn 208 to Romeo November 601 which is maximum 210 as well and above 3,000 feet. Then we turn left, 1609.2 miles towards Gamma, above 6,000 feet. From there we join the Vexo 7 Golf departure, which we have on a chart 10 3 Hotel, RNF-1 or RMP-1 required, and um, we leave Gamma on a track 217, 16.5 miles, inbound to Romeo November 617. Then it's a right hand turn, 146, 13.9 miles, into Edopa. We have once again maximum 210 knots and above flight level 100. And then it's a right hand turn, 305, 27.2 miles inbound to Vexov. Stop climb, we said we're going to take 6,000, so I'll just put 6,000 in here at waypoint 617 as well. Speed restrictions are all in, so that's pretty much that completed. Okay, do you have any questions? No questions, very good. Then I'll quickly say hello to the passengers and then we can go. In the meantime, let's get GSX ready. They are always taking ages to connect. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon from the flight deck. This is your captain speaking. My name is Emmanuel, and in the name of Ryan, welcome aboard our flight towards Napo Genoa today, operated by Malta Air. Expect the flight time today is in the region of approximately 1 hour and 5 minutes and we do expect a smooth flight with an on-time arrival. I would now like to ask you for your full attention for the cabin crew safety demonstration that is going to commence very shortly. That is not just for your own safety but also for the safety of the people sitting around you. For now, thank you very much for joining us and we will get back to you in crews with the latest weather information of our arrival airport. Thank you very much for your attention, and once again, welcome on board. Okay, they're covered. GSX doesn't work as it seems. Let's have a look outside. They, ha they have the aft steps connected, but... I don't know. No idea what this is. No idea whatsoever. Um, Barry, why did I put in 6,000 feet at waypoint 601? 
That is because we want to have a double protection. So first of all, you have the stop altitude in the FMC, and then we also have the stop altitude in, uh, sorry, on the MCP I meant. And then we also have it in the FMC, so that in case we would accidentally select something incorrect on the MCP, VNAV would still level us off at those 6,000 feet. That is the idea why we're doing it. And Higgin, any idea why bags are only loaded in the front? Uh, yeah, that's quite simple. We do it because it saves us a second loading crew and because normally there are not so many bags on board that you would actually need the rear hold. Now there are cases where the rear hold is needed, for example if you do those flights to the Canary Islands where passengers bring really a lot of um, luggage and if that is done then um, the rear hold is of course going to be used. And Budwin, nice to see you here today as well. How did you put the discontinuity in the FMC? Uh, that is quite simple. You insert the waypoint you want to have, then prior to that you insert any waypoint, and then you just press delete and delete that waypoint. So that random waypoint. And then it's automatically going to introduce a root discontinuity. That's a really neat way to insert holdings and stuff like that. All right, in the meantime, let's go ahead and um, start with our performance tool because we do slowly start running a little late. And we have that one available over here, which looks nice and like this. Okay, so had a couple of issues with it. Um, before that it forgot some data. So let's start with the weight and balance stuff today. We'll take the real airplanes loading. We have Winter 21 Alpha catering, nil duty free, and a full portable water tank. The rest of it we'll just take from a sim brief. My call sign is gonna be Romeo Yankee Romeo 1 1 Lima. And that's pretty much our loading. Okay. So we are just going to load that one straight then into the OTT. Have a nice, nice flight. 6,000 kilos fuel on board. Oh yeah, Simreef once again messed up the cargo loading, so we can forget about those weights. That is unfortunate, but well, to be honest, I can't really be bothered fixing that right now, because the profile doesn't exactly match the PMDG 737 anyway. There is a profile for the PMDG available in uh, Virtual Performance Tool. However, if I'm totally honest, I'm not a uh, very big fan of that because it would mean we would have to manually load the airplane once again. And I'm rather happy if I don't have to do that. So for our purposes, however, we have 58.4 tons on board versus 59.0. Now that is fine, giving us a gross weight of 64.5. And uh, for flight simulation purposes, that's what I'm going to use for our takeoff calculation. In real life, of course, we wouldn't do that. In real life, we would, of course, um, do the correct weight and balance calculation. But since um, Virtual Performance Tool cannot interact with our um, flight simulator directly, we'll just have to accept things as they are. So, Napoli 06, Bravo, dry, 2 knots tailwind, 20 degrees, 1022, optimum max 5, auto off, off giving us a 22k takeoff at 42 degrees. So that is what we are going to use. And we'll quickly correct the temperature in here as well. 88.6, 88.6, that makes sense. So, uh, flap 5 takeoff. For the trim, let's just take it straight from the FMC. 6.3 units. And the takeoff speed 140, 142, 146. If the speeds are within one knot of the um, OPT speed, then we can use the OPT. If the um, uh, sorry, then we can use the FMC speeds. If the FMC speeds are more than one knot different from the OPT, then we have to use the uh, OPT speeds. So in this case, we could use V1 and VR, but not V2, because that was two knots difference.
Right, 146 in there, and that is pretty much it. Alright, so let's go ahead and do the safety inspection checks. And before start checklist down to the line. Services and trucks checked, maintenance status checked, battery on, electric hydraulic pumps on, landing gear lever down, ship's library checked, RS mode selectors, nav, gear pins, one, two, three, removed, probe covers, well, most crews are nowadays just hanging them over here, but um, they're supposed to be in here in the pocket, one, two, three, four, five, removed, light test checked, oxygen test 100%, your lamper on, nav transfer and display switches, normal and auto, Fuel, 5,926 required, 6,000, uh, sorry, 5,980 on board, and four pumps on. Cabin utility IFE on, emergency exit lights armed, fasten belts on, window heat on, air con press, pack auto, bleeds on set, pressurization mode selector, auto, instruments, trust check, auto brakes, RTO, hydraulics, normal, speed brake, down attempt, parking brake, set, wheel with fire warning, check, I forgot to stop them cutter switches. They're in normal. Radius radar and transponder, standby, radar and aileron trims, three and zero. Take a briefing, discussed, PA, complete, FMC, CDU. Set, M1 and IS box, automatic, video swing 2K, speed 41, 41, 46, set. Stop trim, 6.3, set, performance weight and balance, sign send, phones off, UFB, airplane mode stowed, flight of windows and cockpit door, locked, doors to go. Right, now G6 is working. Thank you very much for that tip earlier on. Indeed, I just restarted the um, portal engine and now it is working. So, oh, looks like we gotta wait another minute or so for the... Um... Hello, Captain. We are ready for pushback. Looks like we just gotta wait a little bit for GSX to get the tuck connected now. Sorry for that. Um, Nathaniel... How and where did you get the takeoff performance tool? Um, that is a tool called Virtual Performance Tool, and you can find it under virtualperformancetool.com. Virtual check completed. Bypass pin inserted. And it is a really, really good tool. It's really close to the real Boeing onboard performance tool as well. So my fullest recommendation for that, for the time that we don't have the PMDG tool available yet. And Sandvik, about to start typewriting in East Midlands. Well, you are gonna enjoy that, believe me. You are. For the purpose of our flight, unfortunately no A to C online. Here. So we'll just assume that we have our um, clearance now. So 6,000 feet is in. We have the Vexov 7 Golf departure and the Squawk. It's just gonna stay on the standard IFR Squawk. So 2,000. Pushback, we need to face to the right hand side. And you still have anything connected? Ground power, yeah, that can be disconnected and the shock's removed. Please back in brakes. Stand by. Before takeoff checks below the line. Air compacts off, anti collision light on, park and brake set, transponder out off before start checks complete. So that's pretty much everything complete, and we should be more or less ready to go. Double traffic, Ryanair 11 Lima, stand 18, push them back. Commencing push. All engines clear, start at wheel. We'll wait until we are beyond the red line, so beyond there. Our engines basically are right now, so let's go ahead and start engine number two. And two. All pressure. And one. Well, 
buffs are operating correctly. That's always a check that uh, flight simulators tend to uh, forget to do. The first blimp just was the voice recorder switch going back to auto and at 56%. Start a cutout, monitor 2 and we'll go for isolated pack operation starting number 1. Set parking brakes. Cockpit to ground. We have a good engine to start. You can disconnect. Okay, and two, all pressure, and one. Both valves are working. Unlocking gear. Start a cutout, monitor one. We're looking for basically two, four, six, three. And number one is stable. Tow truck disconnected. Bypass pin removed. Left is clear, right is clear. Okay, clear to disconnect, clear signal on the left hand side with a pin, and have a good day, ciao! So, where is he? That looks awful. Good job, GSX. So, where's our handling agent? There he is, he's carrying a pin as well. So, let's go ahead. Generators on, if you off, continuous. Pro beat, we don't need anti eyes. And we can do the flight control track. Pull up, pull down, neutral, pull left, pull right, neutral, and the rudders. Pull left, pull right, neutral. Okay, the ramp agent is going. FMC message, unable 210 knots, that's not going to be a problem. Okay, before taxi checklist. Generators on, APU off, start switches continuous, probe heat on, anti is off, air conditioning, packs auto, bleeds on, isolation off, auto, flaps, 5 required, 5 selected and a green light, step trim, 6.3 units required and set, start levers idly turned, flight controls checked, recall checked, before taxi checks complete. Napoli, Ryanair 11 Lima, taxi auto point from 06 by Alpha. Okay, clear on the left. Clear on the right. Brake released. Config. And let's do the before takeoff checklist down to the line. Config checked, flaps 5, 5, green light, stop trim 6.4 set. Takeoff briefing, left seat takeoff, runway 06, packs auto bleeds on, anti ice off. We are using dry speeds 41, 41, 46, and the sit straight at 4.5 dme, then a left turn, maximum 210, and climbing to an altitude of 3000 feet. Emergencies, we go straight ahead 4.4 miles and a right turn 2 to 8 and when passing the radial from uh, Sierra Alpha Oscar we proceed direct to gimmick, climbing 6,000 feet, squawk is in and reviewed. Cabin, secure, P4 takeoff checklist complete. Okay, clear on the approach, clear on the right. Napoli traffic, Ryanair 1 1 Lima, take off from way 06.
Before Taker checks below the line. MCP, set, transponder, Tara, strobe lights on, landing lights on. Before takeoff check is complete. Timing. Stabilized. Set takeoff thrust. Take a first set, indication is normal. Checked. Command A, fuck up. Flaps one, speed check, flap one. Flaps up, speed check, flaps up. I really have to say, despite the autothrottle issues that got introduced with the latest update, the autopilot itself is doing a really, really good job now. Just look at how accurate it's flying that stuff. And we have flaps up, no lights. Vina. We are not cleared above the transition yet, so we'll remain on QNH and after takeoff checklist. Two to go. Vertical speed. I just want to put the autopilot a bit more to the test here. That's why I'm doing this right now. And not yet continue the climb um, to a higher level. Okay, after takeoff checklist. Air condition and pressurization that is 2.0, slightly climbing or set. So rather warm in there. Let's just go to the standard setting here of basically A, U, and T. And we have one to go, VS 1000. Okay, so altimeters remain on local, and that's the alpha takeoff checklist complete. I quickly want to watch how the airplane levels off here, just to see how the um, autopilot works now with a new update, but. It's doing a pretty good job there. Exactly 6,000. Perfect. Now let's continue our climb. Something high up. Level 200. Set. 200 checked. VNAV. Set standard. And of course we gotta delete the, uh, speed restric uh, the altitude restriction from here. And now here we go. N1, V enough speed, and we can continue our climb. That's exactly um, Bootwin. About your question why we put the uh, 6000 heart in the box, that's exactly the reason why. Um, had I accidentally set my MCP altitude to something incorrect, V enough would just have maintained the uh, 6000 feet before it would have continued the climb. 
Also, we cleared above 15,000, so we can delete our reduced climb. So, full climb for us it is. At this point, let's just go direct A2 car, because not really any need to make that turn, is there? So, a dupa, execute, out of available, out of. Hot meters, part 100, climbing 200, 10 tracks, fuel balanced, we have 4 pumps on, lights off, APU off, air conditioning and pressurization 4.2, climbing and set, fasten belt, let's keep them on for now but we can release our cabin crew so that they can start their service, recall, checked, monitoring 11.5, CPDLC is not available at the level we're going to fly, 10 tracks complete. Lovely visuals in the simulator, as always. So, I don't really see any reason for that 210 restriction at Edupa, so let's get rid of that. In real life, we just have asked ATC now. Any speed restriction? The answer would probably have been no, and then we can accelerate. Of course, otherwise, it's just taking too long. Um, Daniel, is this my beta testing version? Because the auto throttle seems to be perfect. Uh, no, it is still the public release, so I haven't done any changes there. But I told you earlier on that during my beta testing, actually the auto throttle worked perfectly. And then on the last live stream, it didn't. So, I don't know why. I really don't know why, but. Let's see on the approach how it's actually going to be there, because on the approach, it um, that was primarily where it had the problems. So, let's see what it's going to be like when we get to Genoa in an hour. Right, we can release passengers as well. So let's try to put that auto throttle to a test. Let's try if we can actually force that um, bug to happen. So we'll level off at level 200 once again, or at least we'll go to vertical speeds in order to make the auto throttle do something. And then we'll just see if we are actually able to recreate that issue. So now I'm going to show you a little bit of um, how I would approach this stuff in beta testing. So I'm waiting for the 3 to 1 rule to kick in here. So when we reach 18,000 or flatline 180, we should have a maximum of 2,000 feet a minute. We're about approaching that now, so let's go vertical speed. 2,000. Now let's see what's actually going to happen. There we go, it 
reduce the vertical speeds. Target speed slightly increasing, which could happen in the real plane. Not saying it must happen, but it could. It's taken back the thrust. That's actually looking quite alright. Let's try another time, reduce the vertical speed to 1000 feet a minute. Let's see what's going to happen now. Thrust is coming off. Speed is just two knots higher than it's supposed to be, but returning to where it should be. That looks perfect. That looks absolutely perfect, if you ask me. Let's see if we can make things a little bit... Um, let's see if we can put the airplane to a bit more of a challenge by doing the same change when it has to start a turn in a few moments. Let's climb 2,000 feet higher, back to Vina. Let's make it 3,000 higher. This, by the way, is just how I would do it in an actual beta test flight. So I'm always doing it in the same scenarios as we'd have on a normal line flight. And then I'm just putting the system to a test like this. So we're climbing, we're turning, vertical speed. Let's do a bit more dramatic change. Let's go, let's go directly at 1,000 feet a minute. And here we are, 1,000 feet a minute. It's slightly gaining speed now, 3 knots. But it is also reducing thrust. Yeah, the speed overshot by 3 knots, but... That's totally acceptable. Yeah, that looks good to me. But that's exactly what I saw in my actual beta test flight prior to the release. So... It is kind of interesting to put it that way. Let's try one more time. Let's put it up to the cruise level. 300. Vina, and we have level 300 once, twice, and three times, monitoring 1 to 1.5. I'm waiting for it to uh, regain the vertical speed now. And now that we have it, let's assume an ATC stop climb instruction, so we'll just go out hold. It gained a bit speed there, but it, it responded a bit too quick, I have to say. So it should have leveled off much smoother than it just did. Let's try that one more time. Vina? Let's get it to raise that nose. And stop climb, I'll hold. Yeah, that is quite an aggressive pitch down there. Not supposed to do that. It has to be much, much smoother. But, even with the aggressive pitch down, speed is increasing slightly, but the auto throttle is reacting, it's compensating. Kind of twitching a little bit in the pitch here. You can see that a bit better when we're looking outside. It's not supposed to do that, so it looks like the alt hold mode might need a little bit of work there. 
but apart from that it's kind of fine so let's do that one more time and this time we're going to follow the actual SOPs so we'll bring it back in a climb and for those of you who have seen my tutorial videos you know that when we are um, getting an intermittent level of when ATC just says stop climb or stop descent the SOP is to hit altitude hold set the new MCP altitude then hit level change and then you have to determine if you are still supposed to climb then you go back to Vena if you are supposed to descend you can stay in level change or go to vertical speed or um, whatever mode is appropriate so let's say we now get stop climb flight level 250 alt hold Set, 250 tracked, level change. And into Alt Acquire. Ten foot overshoot, perfectly acceptable. The real plane could probably do the same. Okay, so overall, if we follow correct SOP, that certainly looks like a very good level off. Even though, as said, uh, when alt hold initially engaged, it is a little bit aggressive there. Okay, so let's go back up to our cruise level, 300, and this time we really go up there. Set, 300 checked, VNAV, and off we go. Very smooth initiation of the climb. Of course, the moment I say it, it starts twitching a little bit up and down. It shouldn't do that, of course. But yeah, overall, the airplane response is uh, quite okay, with the exception of that rapid um, pitching when pressing Alt Hold. But apart from that, it is really doing a good job here. And we've not been able to force the order throttle issue yet. Let's see if we can do it when we are on the descent into Genoa later on. That is kind of my personal challenge now. I want to force that issue. Let's see as well, top of the sand, 200 miles. Let's go a little bit higher. We have filed on airways, so officially we couldn't go above, I believe, level 305 in Italy. But nonetheless, um, let's, give a look. let's give ourselves a nice direct if there is no ATC online, which there isn't. Let's go direct to Cardu. Execute. Enough available. Oh no. And let's go up level 340. I checked flight radar before I started this flight, and the last real flight has actually been up at 340, so let's do the same. Set. 340 checked. Out an event. Cruise level is updated. Target Mach number increases. And then we also have to set it up here. So we have 340 once, twice, and three times. Now it's still below the optimum. And we're still monitoring 1 to 1.5. The acceleration up here, by the way, also looks quite good. So it went down at a decent rate. It's just barely climbing. Now, the, the real one could possibly go down as low as like 100 feet a minute or something if it tries to accelerate at these high altitudes. So the 450, 500 we see up here is maybe a little bit on the high side. But overall, we are rather close to the target speed already as well, so that is quite okay. We could try the same later on up at a higher flight level. Maybe we're able to um, see what happens when we are at an even higher level, because 300 still isn't that high. It still has a lot of excessive thrust available up here. 
Anglo Bank 10. Okay, so as soon as we've reached our cruise level, we'll have a quick look into our arrival in Genoa already, because there can be quite some shortcuts given there, depending on the star that you're actually flying into Genoa. So let's see um, which one we've actually gotten today. I'm mostly used to approaching Genoa from the north, not from the south. So let's see what's going to happen this time. Approaching one to go, vertical speed, thousand feet a minute. And Dr. Deepel, how do you call that line on the navigation display which is green and slightly curved and moving? What is that? It's called the altitude range arc and it tells you where you are going to reach the MCP selected altitude. So in our case, we can see here that it says that we'll need round about two and a half miles to reach the um, flight level 340. Alt acquire. Bina. And here we are. So, concert. And welcome to flight level 340. Now, before I start to look at Genoa, let's quickly have another look at our um, operational flight plan. As we've just reached our cruising altitude. So, top of climb, 14 minutes, level 300. We took 22, we are 4,000 feet higher. Now, of course, we took quite a bit longer because we um, have done all those intermittent level offs and a little bit of like, experimenting down there. Should have 4.5, we have 4.1, now that once again can very well be explained. A look ahead at Kadu, we're estimating to be there at uh, 59, which is then gonna be 43 minutes in the air. So looking at the plan, Kadu, 43 we're supposed to have, and um, we're gonna be there exactly at 43 minutes. Supposed to have 3.3 tons, estimated at 3.5 in the FMC. You can see that down here, so it looks like we are going to be right um, spot on when we reach Cardu with an additional 200 kilograms of fuel in the tanks. Of course we're waiting a little bit less, so we are 700 kilos lighter than planned in the OFP. So that makes uh, sense as well. And we have flown a little shortcut there as well. So let's have a look into our arrival then. Arriving from Calmo. And that one is bringing us towards Gcut. Let's take that up here. Just quickly see what else there is available. Coming from Calmo. 
Calmo for Golf is rather short, for Alpha is pretty much the same, so I'm rather happy with the star that we've gotten here. Now it would help if I would actually look in at the correct runway, which is 2-8 plan for us, but that looks pretty uh, close as well, so... I'm happy with the arrival we've gotten, and for the approach itself we have the ILS Zulu, which we're gonna take. It's slightly offset, so, so that's gonna be interesting on the final approach. So that's pretty much what it looks like. You can see there's quite some additional track miles in there, so quite a good potential that we might end up very high on the approach. Now, if we just about look at the uh, real flight that we are doing right now, we have that one available on Flight Radar 24, and I basically always like to have a quick look there. So, thank you, Flight Radar. I'll take your cookies. You can see the actual airplane departed on quite a similar course as we did. Going down here, flying along the coastline of Italy. And then they basically went straight in. So, I guess they probably just got it direct from air traffic control or some radar vectoring up here. But let's see what we can um, determine from their descent profile. As said, they've been at 340, descended down, and that looks like pretty much a continuous descent to me. So, I always like to have a little look if I'm flying an arrival that I haven't flown in real life, to, just to see how they um, do it in real life over there. So now that we have a basic idea, we can from that conclude how is air traffic control probably going to get us in. And um, making our decision from there, we can see that um, probably from somewhere over here, from uh, GPIX or MBOSS, we'll probably get a direct to the final approach. Now, of course, in real life we don't have that information available, but in real life um, I would have planned something like this as well. So probably something like this, um, TGLO direct to the um, 105 waypoint or direct to the Charlie India to see where that is going to end us up. So we just about do the same. Let's see what we get from Embos direct to the um, Charlie India. And that is then going to give us a very good estimation. The flight level 183 over here. So I'll just take 183 below, put that in at Embos, and that is going to give us a better vertical profile for our arrival into Genoa. So, for the rest of it, speed to 50 below 100, forecast, what do we have here, transition level, okay, 7000 for the altitude, we'll probably not be able to get out some weather for Genoa yet from the flight simulator, so we'll just about take it from the flight plan, not 100% up to date, but nonetheless it should be good enough to um, give us a basic idea of what we're about to do. So, have that down here just below the additional, uh, sorry, just above the additional info box. So, let's start with the flight levels, insert our winds, and then from there on we'll go ahead and um, do the rest with the uh, actual airport weather. So, we have 261 at um, 34. In here, then we have 265 at 30. And finally, we have 246 at 24. So that's going in. Then look at the weather list for arrival QNH 1020. Probably hasn't changed much, maybe a hectopascal or so. And since that is a QNH which is um, higher than standard, I expect the transition layer to be just about a thousand feet foot thick. So if we have a look at our arrival chart again, transition altitude 7000. If the layer is a thousand feet, which it has to be at least, 
then that means um, our transition level is estimated to be 80 on the arrival. Also, we have a note here, warning max 160 knots at 5 miles from the touchdown zone. So if you just start programming our um, fixed rings here, we're looking at three times the cruise level is uh, 102. Now, if we just go to the meters display, it also tells us, like, you take the first three digits, 103. That is basically what you can use as a small shortcut there as well. I'll take the exact number, um, 34 times 3, 102. We need a 10 mile ring and we need a 4 mile ring. That basically concludes our setup here. Last thing we can do 157, 6 miles out, that's fine with me. I'll take a 180. Not restriction at uh, 10 miles, so at the Charlie India as well. And that's pretty much the preparation that we need to do for our arrival. Right then, last thing, frequencies, forces, minimums, the basics for any ILS approach. We have 184, that's going into both courses there, 184. The frequency is 109.3. And in case I miss approach, we do have a VOR there, says 3, 108.6. We can also tune that in the standbys. All right. Minimums are gonna be Cap Charlie Airplane 879. The Ryanair aircraft are certified with a maximum landing weight of uh, 65317, so 65 uh, tons 317 kilos. And um, therefore, with that at the maximum landing weight, the flap 40 VRF speed is going to be just below the limit for a category Delta airplane. So there are some uh, holiday operators who have certified their aircraft to a maximum or to a higher maximum landing weight. And um, that might put them into a category Delta. So you might have to take the uh, cut Delta minimums. But if you're coming in at 65.3 tons, then the airplane is still a category Charlie. So that's not going to do um, all too much there. Right, so that's our setup complete. Let's go ahead with the um, let's go ahead with the approach briefing there. And a quick comment from Robin: You seem tired. Um, not really, to be honest. Um, of course, I'm doing all this stuff for the hundredth time, and even though it's still fun to do it in flight simulator, you know. Done it all a hundred times. Um, Adam, can you please explain the descent forecast transition level? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, you always put the transition level into there, not the transition altitude. So, for the takeoff, you need the altitude, and for the descent, you need the level. And the um, transition level is, of course, given by air traffic control, so you would get it from the ATIS. But if you don't have an ATIS available, like um, we currently don't have in Flight Simulator, then you can always use the uh, transition altitude and add the transition layer on top of that. The transition layer has to be at least 1,000 feet thick and Therefore, we have to take into account several different factors. For example, if your QNH is below standard, so if it's 1013 or less, then you need at least 2000 or in some countries 1500 feet for the transition layer. So, for example, if we have a transition altitude like we have on our arrival in Genoa of 7000 feet, and if we assume a QNH of 1010, then if an airplane was flying at flight level 80 and then changed the altimeter to the local, it would be somewhere around 7,900 feet. Therefore, the transition layer would be less than 1,000 feet thick. And um, that in turn would mean that we'd have to have a transition altitude of um, 
flight level 90 in order to be assured that we always have at least 1000 feet vertical separation between an altitude flying at the transition altitude and the lowest usable flight level. Now what I've done on this arrival, if we have a look into the forecast page, we have a transition, uh, sorry, we have a QNH of 1020. Now that means if an airplane flying at flight level 80 changes its altimeter to the local setting, then it would get some 300 feet more indicated on the altimeter. And therefore, we can say that our transition layer, which has to be at least a thousand feet, would actually be more than a thousand feet already if we take flight level 80 as the lowest usable flight level. And therefore, 80 becomes the transition level. That is how you can calculate it. And now on the forecast page in here, we put 80 in because that is the expected transition level for the given conditions. Now, in the um, ATPL theory, things are going to get a little bit more interesting even because they're going to get, take temperature deviations into account as well. And then you will be asked questions like transition altitude um, 70, transition level 80, QNH 1010. What can you say about the temperatures on the ground? And then, of course, we know that hot air expands, so the transition, uh, the QNH is below standard, but we nonetheless have a transition level of 80. So we do know that it has to be a really hot day on the ground. So that is roughly how we do it. And how we um, determine the transition um, level if we don't have anything from A to C available. Now, of course, in real life, that's not going to happen. In real life, you're always going to have um, an ATIS available. And if you don't have an ATIS, you can ask air traffic control and they're going to tell you. But that's what you can do in Flight Simulator in order to actually do this. So let's go ahead with the descent briefing then. Threats for the arrival. We have high terrain all the way to the north. So we're looking at um, 4,000 feet over here. And it can go a little bit higher even over here. The highest on the chart is 5,000 691. Now for the MSAs we can see 8,300 the highest in the north and even down to the south it's 6,000 feet. So rather high MSAs over here. We have to take that into account when we're getting directs from air traffic control. Especially if we should be in IMC at any point because that could really get nasty. Apart from that um, the final approach is a little bit offset. So let's see if we have that available on the chart anywhere here. Theoretically it should be um, printed somewhere on the chart, but I know it's a few degrees here. We can see final approach course 284, and if we look at the um, chart, it's 283, so there's a little bit of an offset in there. We are going to see that when we get to our final approach. Apart from that, 250 knots below level 100, forecast page filled out, rings around from a 28, 10 miles, 4 miles, and I have a second ring about the Sierra Echo Sierra VOR which is for this line over here, which we shall not overshoot. And to the north of it, there is an area of magnetic abnormality, which means our compass indications might just about become meaningless if we start flying into that area. So that's a bit of a threat as well. If we do overshoot that radial here, we're just going to forget about the compass. We'll use the navigation display to get ourselves out of that area again. So LNAV is always reliable in these cases. So uh, we'll just go LNAV direct towards Exito down here, and that's going to get us back to the water where we don't have the um, threat of the Cumulus Granitos up here. So our arrival then is inserted and is over here, the um, Calmo 1 November arrival, which is from Calmo Mike Juliet 413, and then we'll go on via Tiglo, Mike Juliet 414, Mike Juliet 416, maximum 230 knots, on towards Gikut, and from there we join the ILS Zulu approach for runway 28. And for that approach we have frequencies 109.3, active both sides, course at 284 on both sides, and down to the minimum of two, uh, 879. And for the standard approach, down here from Gikut, we join the 19 DME arc. We have to defined by those two Alpha Fox waypoints up here. 
until 18 DME and the radial 1073, which is the uh, D110 Sierra point. Then we'll make a left-hand turn 284 onto the final approach track, Fab at 10 miles, 3370, that's the Charlie India. Then descend down 7 miles, we have 2360. 6 miles, 2026, and that's our Fox India up here. What is our thrust doing? Oh, I just increased a little bit, that's why. So speed increased a bit, that's why auto throttle is pulling some thrust off. That's understandable. Reset MCP altitude. Uh, actually, let's not do that yet, because I want to show you a little bit of uh, VNAV stuff that you can play around with later on. So, 6 miles, 2026, and from there on down to the minimum, 879. Missed approach if we have to. It's gonna be turn left as soon as practicable, max 200 knots. So, over here it wants to go 400 AGL, then turn left. Follow radial 180 from Seth Tree, climb at 3000 feet and proceed to Exito. So in here we go 177 towards Exito, climbing 3000. And the 200 knot restriction here is just for the initial turn, so after that we can buck up. If you go around, Toga, go around 515, set go around first, raise landing, go with a positive rate, 400 feet. Uh, flaps 5, flaps 1, we keep it in 1 for the turn. And once we have completed the turn, we accelerate. We might probably have to buck up manually there. No, thanks, energy compensation. I don't need you yet. Um, so yeah, we are going to buck up manually. And when the flaps are retracted, engage the autopilot after takeoff checklist and decide on a further course of action. And that's pretty much that part of the briefing complete. Okay. Then for a diversion, we have Bergamo Airport. To do that, we need 2.5 tons of fuel. We have 3.0 on the arrival, which includes the whole um, little bit complicated thing over there. So 500 kilos, the plane uses 200 kilos per 5 minutes, so we are looking at around about 10 minutes safe, plus a little bit of extra fuel. Burning 500, which is a landing weight of 61.4. 61.4 is going in. Now we have to have a look at the... Um, Landing performance, let's do that real quick. So, landing and route, we go towards the NOI runway 2A, 2.5, dry, 210 at 4. We have 19 degrees, 10, oops, 20. Flap config, let's calculate 30 initially, and we have 61,400 as the landing weight. So, 2,179 meters, 47 minutes brake cooling. That is, of course, for a 25 minute turn not acceptable, so we go reverse all operational. Then it gives me 14 minutes with flap 30, auto brakes 3, so that sounds pretty good. Let's do that. Alright, so that's our landing performance, and that's um, how we determine that if we're going to use either reverse or not. And finally, we're from way to eight down here, 2,900 meters, so we'll probably vacate via Charlie, Alpha, and then somewhere to the main apron over here. We'll have to see where exactly we're gonna park. Any questions on the briefing? No questions? Very good. Then. Now I told you I wanted to show you a little bit of Venus stuff. So we're currently um, at 245 knots, and we are 3,700 feet high, so let's start our descent and try to get our airplane back on profile now. We'll go level 250 initially, that's a typical level you might be cleared to. Alternate event, we'll start our way down and we can close our speed window. So 4000 feet high, but we have 245 knots in there. And that is where the cost index 6 really comes to help you. Because of that slow speed that is used to compute your descent path, you can easily increase it so let's say, for example, we want to go 0.77 and 300 knots. Okay, that was a good guesstimate, but look at that, we're right back on profile. And we've got to catch up a little bit of that speed. No auto throttle, you can stay in idle. So let's actually reduce that a little, and let's say we want 290 knots. That is going to put us a little bit high on the VNOC profile, as we can see. But the plane's still got to descend so much uh, and uh, pick up all those 25 knots over here. So let's see where that is going to end us up. 
And this way, I'll just play with the um, target speed in the descent now, and we can really make up a lot without having to use the speed brake, just because our initial descent speed was computed at 245 knots. And the faster you fly, the more drag you have. Of course, flying that slow, Angular Bank 25, as we're passing level 300. And look at that. Back on the profile, back on the speed. So, even though we've got now a descent clearance like two or three minutes after we would originally have requested it, we're right back on profile. And we still have quite a bit of margin left. So that's one of the real um, advantages of just using a very low cost index and therefore having the descent calculated at uh, such a low speed. And there is somebody saying, passengers' ears are gonna hurt. Uh, no, they aren't. Because the passengers aren't, just aren't gonna notice. Look at what the um, cabin is doing here. It's descending at 400 feet a minute as the um, computer is trying to catch up. Now it might go to seven or 800 at times. That the real plane does that, but even that, you know, unless you you really have a cold, so unless something blocks your ears and the um, canals in your ears, you aren't gonna feel it. You really aren't gonna feel it. The cabin pressure computer just does an excellent job maintaining the cabin vertical speed at a decent rate while the airplane is descending a lot faster. Let's try to do that once more. So let's descend down to uh, 150 and I'll just go vertical speed here. Let's take 5,000 feet a minute nose down. And as we do that, now we are descending at quite a good rate. Watch the cabin vertical speed. So this is what the passengers are going to feel. Because this is how quick or not the cabin changes its altitude. Well, the actual airplane, as we can see, is just going down really rapidly. Okay, back to Vina. So you can see it doesn't really matter if you go down that quick. We do it all the time because it does happen so often in Europe that air traffic control is just keeping you high and the passengers hardly feel it at all. Also, there is a really widespread rumor in um, flight simulation that passengers would get afraid if you, you know, um, if you would do a steep descent. Now, the honest answer to that is passengers hardly even notice. They can barely make out the actual pitch at which you're flying. And keep in mind, we're just talking about a five degree difference here. So if you pitch it down five degrees, you're doing 6,000 feet a minute. And um, they can hardly make it out by looking outside the windows. So that really is a flight simulator myth. Then does Ryanair use the cost index of 6 all the time? Not all the time, but mostly. The only reason if they might increase the cost index is if you are um, like seriously delayed approaching the 3 hours where you have to do compensation or where you have to pay compensation to the passengers or if you are about to miss a night curfew or something. So in those situations a higher cost index, typically 100, can be given but normally they are always flying cost index 6. And if you're totally honest it doesn't make that much of a difference. So when we're on the ground in Genoa preparing our flight back to Napoli I'm going to show you a little bit on the RTA page how much time you could actually make up by using a higher cost index. And I'll explain a little bit of that on the ground when we are preparing our next flight. Just to give you a better idea of um, why it does make sense to use these very low cost indexes. Also, if you watch my video on the topic of uh, cost indexes, I've explained in there that even major airlines operating on a high cost basis would save a lot of money without having a serious impact on schedules if they went to low cost indexes.
And Adam, why does Econ Descent use a slow speed for the cost index? Um, primarily because if you are reducing your or well, let's let's say that different. Um, the lower the cost index, the lower the sp target speed in the descent, and the lower the target speed, the lower your drag, and the lower your drag, the lower the thrust required. Therefore, you can keep the engines in idle for a longer time. Typically, at cost index six, if you start your descent, your um, descent will take roughly half an hour. Versus at cost index 100, it's going to take approximately 22, 23 minutes. So those eight minutes in idle thrust spare you like two or 300 kilograms of fuel. You fly a bit longer, that's true. So if you compare a descent at 245 with a descent at 300 knots, you save approximately five minutes if you fly faster. By the way, let's go to level change and um, take our airplane a bit further down because I will take that shortcut. Actually, you know what? Let's take that shortcut now. We we saw how the real airplane just went straight in, so let's gonna do the same. Direct 10 mile final and execute. Enough, enough. And let's slow the speed down a bit so that we don't need thrust. That looks better. So, um, as said, if you were to do your descent at 300 knots, then you will reach your destination 5 minutes earlier, but you're gonna use about two or 300 kilograms more fuel. Now, seeing that a kilogram of fuel costs roughly 1 euro, you have to ask yourself the question, is being at the destination 5 minutes earlier really worth 300 euros? On top of that, Typical airport charges for staying on the stand longer is per minute usually something around 120 to 150 euros. I'm talking about German airports right now. So if you were there five minutes earlier and you spent those five additional minutes on the ground, it would cost you easily six to seven hundred euros additional airport charges. Alright, so why is it calculate? Why do we need thrust right now? It shouldn't do that. It should have calculated an idle descent. Ah, no, we flew over a waypoint with a constraint in it, so it actually made up a geometric descent. Let's fix that. Choose level 150. And as soon as we pass the new top of descent, which apparently we have passed now, it should now calculate an idle path descent. I personally find that a bit annoying with a geometric path descent and it, actually in real life the aircraft I fly don't have that feature. That really makes life a bit easier in my opinion. But well, that's what it is. Okay, so I'm talking and explaining so much that I once again totally forgot my descent checklist, so let's go ahead and do that now. Pressurization, land out zero, anti ice off, approach with fuel, discussed, IS not box, check and set. Descent checks complete. And fast melts on.
Okay, so what was the MSA again in the area? Coming from down here, 6,000 feet. Let's go down to 6,000. Set, 6,000 check. Set altimeter 1020. Passing 11.9, descending 6,000. No flex, standby altimeters. Set. By the way, I just used the terms geometric path descent and idle path descent a bit more. So um, let's just quickly talk about that for a second. And I'm gonna answer a couple of um, more of the questions from the comments in a moment, but I just quickly want to go into that because I believe it does matter and I'm not 100% sure if everybody actually understands what that stuff means. So geometric path descent basically means you cross a waypoint at a certain um, altitude. So we had that restriction of flight level 183 or less in at the waypoint that we overflew before we gave ourselves that direct. So from that waypoint, from flight level 183, the aircraft would then calculate an uh, sorry a constant rate of descent to the next constraint. So it would make up a constant rate of descent. On contrary, the air and that is by the way what the PMDG has equipped. Now on contrary the idle path descent feature which is what Ryanair has equipped in the aircraft but which unfortunately is not yet a feature in the PMDG. On contrary to that the idle path descent would just have leveled off at flight level 183 after that waypoint and then it would have more or less entered another truth phase before it would um, then continue a descent with idle thrust once again. So that is the difference between the two. And that is why we just saw a descent that had a thrust required after we gave ourselves that direct. And then I entered a new truth level at 150, which was basically more or less where we were. And since it was in cruise again, it recalculated an idle path descent. Now it just happened that we overflew the um, top of the sand at the same moment, so, um, well, that was just a coincidence. Okay, we've passed 10,000, let's do the 10 checks. Fuel is balanced with four pumps on, the lights are going on, angle of bank 25, air condition and pressurization is 2.8, descending and set. The fastened belts are on. Recall checked and 121.5 deselected. Coming through 10 minutes to landing. 10 checks complete. Right, so for now, my auto throttle really seems to do a good job here. Let's see if I can force it into um, acting up. Let's use a bit of speed brake and bring it into the descent under speed margin which is 15 knots on this airplane. So we're looking at 235 knots and that's the point where it should add the thrust again to go back to the 250 knots. In the meantime, we'll put the target altitude down to 3400 in order to actually keep it in Vina path mode. So let's try to force that buck once again. Okay, approaching 235, let's see what it's going to do. Should change to uh, FMC speed, there we are. I'll retract the speed brakes. So, let's see what it's going to do now. Now look at that, the thrust comes up to a decent level, 56%, 
it starts reducing. Let's see if it's going to overshoot. Retard now. Overshooting just slightly, two or three knots. Now that is exactly what I saw in my beta test prior to the release. So that is what I meant, guys, when I told you that when I tested the beta, I just didn't see the issue. And it's not appearing now as well. So that's really strange. But yeah, look at that. It's doing it perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Right, so, about to reach the desal point. Let's do a frisk check real quick. Frequencies, 109.3. Rings, around from A28, 10 miles, 4 miles. Items, Golf Sierra Echo, Golf Sierra Echo, Golf Sierra Echo. Standby instruments are set, courses 284. Approach checklist, altimeters and instruments, second trust checked, approach aids, checked and set, approach checklist complete. Cabin is secure. Now that we're about to enter IMC, just another very good point here from using the vertical situation display. Now, we know there is some terrain here, and on the VSD we can actually see a very good representation of that. That's one of the really good uses of the vertical situation display, and that's the reason why it's mandatory to have it on latest after the approach checks on the pilot monitoring side in uh, my airline. Right, let's go flap one. Speed checked. Clear for the approach. Approach is armed. And we have flap one, flap five, speed checked. Flap five. I'll help it a little bit with the deceleration. Let's get the speed brakes out. And we cleared for the ILS, so let's bring up the progress page 4, because it does show you your cross-track error if there is any, and it shows you your vertical deviation from the target path. And in the meantime, lovely terrain here in... Um, really lovely terrain here in Genoa. Okay, we have localizer capture and glide stop capture. From the heading 284, 3000 feet set. So our speed is about approaching the flap target speed. And once again, we can see the auto throttle is behaving. I'm not touching anything, just to uh, confirm that. So yeah, it does behave. That is what I saw during the beta test as well. Very noted. And let's do a little bit. No, let's just monitor it. But yeah, that. That's what I saw during the beta. Maintaining the speed very well here. Nothing to complain about.
Okay, a little bit of a tailwind. Let's start configuring the airplane now. Gear down, 515. Landing checklist. Start switches, continuous, recall, check, speed brake. On green light, landing gear down, 3 green. Hard brake, preset. Holding at flaps. Flaps 30. Speed check. Flaps 30. Okay, flaps, 30, 30, green light, landing lights, on, landing check complete, crew seated, and we are clear to land. Yeah, so the auto throttle is working perfectly here. Absolutely nothing to complain about. 1,000. Checked. But, that's it, auto throttle, thank Plus you for your work. Disconnecting. Recycle flight directors. Minimums. Continue. I told you the approach is a little bit offset. This is what we see right now. A little bit of uh, thermals here. Sink rate. Correcting. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Speed break up, crossbow is normal. 80%. One hundred knots, eighty knots, sixty knots, and manual brakes. Should have gone to manual braking a bit earlier, but uh, well. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of updrafts there on final. That made it kind of interesting because it did push me up a little bit. But it was interesting to see as well that for 1,100 feet a minute, the um, GPWS already came on. So that did seem a little bit excessive to me. But well, nonetheless, we corrected it, and it wasn't a hard warning, so it wasn't a pull up. Therefore, we were allowed to continue from that. Okay. Small trick there. Pressing level change in order to um, get the speed down to 100. Saves you from having to uh, turn that speed knob. So, now comes the question, do we have money? Yes, we do. Do we have time? No, we don't. So we're not gonna park on a terminal position, or at least not on the jetway position. So let's say we're gonna park somewhere over here. 206 sounds good to me. So ramp. 
Unit 6. Request follow me. Yeah, in real life you'd probably get one here. But I just can't be bothered waiting for it now, so let's do it like this. And starting APU. Three minutes are over, shut down engine two. Master Caution, Elec, Source of Two, Associated. Okay, the martial law is there. It's too bad that GSX does not use any of the um, hand signals that we use in real life, but something totally different there. Never seen a marshal do this in real life. Well, I've also not seen a marshal standing in the grass in real life, though, so there you got it. Okay, we have two blue, one red. Engine's dead. Cabin crew, doors to manual and cross check. Engine 1 and 2 below 20%. Transit shutdown checklist. And you guys can already start deboarding. We only have 25 minutes after all. So let's start our timer. The boarding, boarding requested. requested. Gonna do the same here. So transit shutdown checklist. Electrical, APU, fast melts off, pro beat, auto, anyways off, voice recorder on, air complex auto, engine bleed on, APU bleed off, exterior light set. Start switches off, auto brakes off, speed brake down at hand, flaps up and light, parking brake set, start levers cut off, weather radar off, transponder, 2000 standby, CVSCV in, pocket door unlocked. Shutdown checklist complete. Alright, I promised you we'd fly the uh, return flight from the first officer's seat. But in the meantime, let's have a quick look at the uh, landing that we just did. I'm trying to get up the uh, landing report from SimToolkit Pro right now. Passenger's bus is coming. So, view full landing report. It's usually taking a little bit of time, but here we are. So, that's our landing report. We did 268 feet a minute, so proper Ryanair landing. We just about missed our aiming point by half a marker, but well within the touchdown zone. On the center line, so that is pretty much all we can ask for, is it? 1.1 G, 268 feet a minute. Positive, but exactly what we're looking for. Alrighty, so for the next sector. Now in real life we would probably have to wait a little bit for the refueler to arrive because they are just always late. What's GSX doing? Passengers the boarding starting. Thank you. Why do they even touch my CDU? Well, no comment on that. 
Anyway, trucks are in. Hockenberg can be released for brake cooling. Ground power is here as well, so let's put that on. Saves a bit of fuel, and at 19 degrees, we certainly don't need the um, APU to cool down our airplane. Uh, Slavic, we heard sync rate, but on the PFD there was pull up. Is that accurate? Yes, it is accurate. But be aware that um, for a GPWS warning to count as a hard warning, you would actually have to hear the audio um, saying pull up and not the PFD just showing it. And stick, the landing report is from Sim Toolkit Pro, so that's integrated into that and not a separate um, tool. Right, so let's quickly type in our um, return flight. I'm planning it in Simbrief as we speak, so give me a second and then we'll be on our way back to um, Naples, Napoli. So we set 25 minute turnaround. Bye -bye. The on block of the last one was scheduled to be 1320, so that means our off block is going to be at 1345. So we've actually been running a little bit late here, but yeah, we departed a bit late as well, so that kind of makes uh, sense. Anyway, we'll try to turn the airplane around as quickly as possible now. In real life, of course, it's a little bit easier because you do have your flight plan available the moment you get on block. However, in uh, Flight Simulator, Things are a bit different, so we'll just about imagine that in real life you would have to fill out the uh, post-flight documents and submit them to the company, so uh, if it takes a little tiny bit longer to get everything set up in Flight Simulator, because I have to generate my flight plan overall, then that is uh, acceptable. All right. What's that child screaming Aua there? Like Aua, is it Austrian Airlines? Alright, just fooling around, sorry for that. So our return flight plan is ready. Let's have a look at Sim Toolkit Pro once again. And as soon as Sim Toolkit Pro has actually loaded... It does sometimes take a little while, usually though not as long. Nonetheless, here we are. So let's have a look at our return flights. We have the flight plan available up here. So we already checked the um, no temps, no need to have a look at those again. Weather is forecast generally for runway 24 now with a wind variable at five knots, so it could be either runways. Anyway, won't play much a role. Our alternate in uh, Rome Fiumicino is Cavalcade as well, so no reason to take any extra fuel. Let's go with standard. And standard fuel on this one would be 6.4. So 6.4 it is. Let's put that into the um, PMDG fuel truck. I'm once again using the PMDG truck for that and uh, not GSX because GSX just doesn't quite cut the corner there in my opinion. But uh, I'm still working on that GSX uh, video now. So let's go ahead and do a little bit more of um, planning then. Lima, India, Mike, Juliet towards Lima, India, Romeo, November, and we are the Ryanair. What's that here? 7 Juliet, November. Departure on May 28, so we'll probably have an interesting sit there. Genoa 5 Echo. Then our routing is leading us direct Calmo. Direct Mifki. Direct Berok. Direct Osmox. Direct Amtel. Do you want to deboard crew? Uh, 
no, most certainly not. So, last passenger bus is going already. Let's quickly go ahead then and insert the new zero fuel weight and thereafter we can um, request a new boarding already. So payload 179 we have this time. Actually we have our load sheet available here in um, GSX as well, so 176. And probably a tiny bit of luggage we planned at a zero fuel weight. 58.6, so that means we have 600 kilos more, so 932, let's just take about that. Weight is always a little bit lower in actual operation than it is on the plan, because um, tickets are so cheap, people buy it and then they don't show up. So, Boarding request boarding. Requested. Crew bus is coming. Why do they send a crew bus now? We've literally just arrived here. And we even told them we don't want to debot the crew. Oh boy, GSX. No comment on that, really. No comment on that at all. I mean, are they trying to board a second crew now? Well. Let's just head back into the flight deck. We got a flight plan to enter. So, we stopped at Amtel. And direct Soban. Flight plan is literally all directs. I haven't seen that yet. Passengers bus is coming. So, Jiken, Chiba. Paymar. In real life, we would probably have pre-programmed the route in flight by using the uh, Route 2 feature. Unfortunately, PMDG does not yet have that available. I really hope it's going to come. Because it is a feature that's used really frequently. But I might just about have to uh, file another report there and request it. And finally, we end up at Teano. Arrival has programmed the ILS the Romay 2 for this time. And for the arrival, we have Teano 1 Mike that leads us to Bento. So that's what we're going to take on this one. Then 58.6. Passengers boarding starting. Oh, it's meant to be here. Fueling is finished, so we can put the seatbelts back on. Reserves 3.2, choosing at flight level 370, winds 275 at 30, what's that, 37? Minus 3 degrees, so minus 59, and we have 7001 as the transition altitude. Temperature, we set 19. So now comes the interesting part about the engine outset once again, because there is quite some high terrain right in front of us. So, doesn't look like Blackbox actually has data available for that, that is unfortunate. Well, in that case, stand by a second. In that case, I can unfortunately not tell you the source of the engine outset, but you can sort of imagine where I'm taking this from. So our engine outset is going to be straight at one mile from Sierra Echo Sierra. And then turn left, direct to Exito. 
And at Exito hold 180 in mount left turn, so we're gonna draw a 360 radial around that one. Fill out the VNAV when we are actually in flight, apart from that. That's pretty much of our um, FMC setup complete, I would say. Then once again, everything turned on. In the turnaround, it's usually a rather quick check. Destination elevations of Napoli is um, 300. No maintenance here. Let's see if we have um, any initial climb on the charts, but in Italy it's uh, rather rare that you actually have it, so we might just as well have to make something up once again, just like we did on the um, inbound flight. Yep, again, nothing published, so let's just take something really high here. Let's take Fatal 100, that at least keeps us clear of all the weather and uh, sorry, of all the train, of course. Okay, so... Enough setup, doesn't really look like there's anything we can do about that. So let's just take it as that. Good evening, ma'am. How are you? I'm doing good. Now we have that click spot. Good. Here it is. Okay. Put test three VR active, and that's gonna cover us. And we can also put tune Genoa twelve point eight and twelve point eight. Internet acceleration probably in the region of a thousand AGL since we'll have the initial turn completed and then we'll be just over water. Alright. So let's do a departure briefing. Uh, threats for the departure, certainly high terrain. We can see that on the SID chart over here. MSA 8300, partially even 9500. So the first turn really is the thing. We can see that looking out here, some rather high terrain over there. So uh, we'll make sure not to accidentally fly into that. Apart from that, VSD will... Yeah, we can use the VSD and we will certainly use the train display. And uh, that's pretty much that. So let's go ahead and do a route check then. So for the route check, Lima India, Mike Juliet, Lima India, Romeo, November, Romeo, Aki, Romeo, 7, Juliet, November. The routing is via Genoa, direct Calmo, direct Mifki, direct Berak, direct Osmox, direct Amtel, direct Savan, direct Jikin, direct Tiber, direct Pema, direct Octep, direct Indox, direct Alaxi, direct Teano, and the ground distance is 390 versus 3. Is that due to a different runway? Yeah, plant on 06 over here with the direct in, so no star plan. So a little bit more distance makes sense. 3.9 tons on arrival, 3.2 required for diversion towards Rome Fiumicino, giving us approximately 17 minutes of extra fuel. Time UTC 1345, altimeter 1020, reading 20 feet, MFRA 1020, flat rectors on minus master this time. And these damper instruments are set. Right to take off, runway 28, flap 5, noise abatement 2, and we have an EO. It's straight at 1 mile from uh, Sierra Echo Sierra. We can quickly draw that ring in. So 1 mile Sierra Echo Sierra, then a left hand turn, join the radio 180, um, uh, sorry, join the bearing 180 holding in my Exito. And Exito is located over the water, so I'm happy at an altitude of 3000 feet. If the call before we want to keep going, no actions below 400 feet except to cancel our warnings, raise landing over the positive rate at 400 feet, flap 5, and um, sorry, 400 feet, memory items at the MFRA, back up, recheck, button schedule, flap set light, level change, MCT, engage the automatics, non normal checks, normal checks, and then we decide. Okay, 
Okay, um, then, pushback. Do we need any? No, we have a taxi outline over here. Let's quickly see. Yeah, we can taxi out directly, so we don't need pushback. That's good. Even though they parked us, like, so much ahead of the stop bar. Well, doesn't really matter. So we can do taxi out. We'll just have to get rid of all the equipment then. Okay. Um, so that's the taxi out. And then we are probably gonna go... Let's get the chart. Over Mike, Papa, Foxtrot. And looking at the chart, we can take either Foxtrot or Golf figures. But we'll probably calculate from Foxtrot and then we'll see if we take either Foxtrot or Golf. Depending on what our um, OPT actually has available. Then we have the Genoa 5 Echo Departure on a chart 10-3 effective 16th of June. Transition altitude 7000 versus 7001 in here. And um, routing straight at 800 feet. Then a left turn max 185 knots. We do actually not have that in here. So let's put that in. 185 knots in the turn to intercept 180 directing to Exito. Exito max 230, above 4,500 feet. Right turn towards Anarchy. Let's quickly check that one in here. So Exito, right towards Anarchy, above 5,500. And then 046, 20.4 inbound to Genoa. So we can put 046 on the course on my side. We'll keep the runway track on your side. And um, Genoa VOR is active on both sides. Any questions? No, okay. Very good. Okay, then. Time to have another look at the OPG. And we are gonna reset current aircraft. We'll just take it straight from here. And I'm not gonna do the performance for the reason mentioned on the last flight. So we said we wanted both figures, I believe. What does the chart say? Yep, both. The runway is dry, wind 210 at 319 degrees 1019 now. Okay, so set out meter 1019. Reading 0. Okay. Fair enough for me. I can certainly live with that. So we have 58.4 versus 58.6, that's close enough, and we have 64.9, which we'll use in here then. 64,900. Okay, 22k at 41 degrees. Sorry, 24k at 41 degrees. And a temperature of 19. It's 91.8. That's 0.8 difference in the N1 from the OPT and the FMC. That is because we don't have the uh, bleed air system pressurized at the moment. So it does assume a bleed off takeoff. And therefore, it calculates a higher N1 in here than it does in the OPT, where it, of course, knows if we want to use engine bleeds or uh, not. Right, so, 0.8 difference, that is correct. Plus 5, and then we'll just take the trim from here, 6.3 units, and speed's 39, 40, 46. That matches exactly, so let's take that. And 1, 4, 6. Right, perfect. So, that's the takeoff performance complete. MFRA was 10.13. We can quickly dial that one in as well. And here we go. So, transit before start checklist down to the line. Gibbons, one to three removed. There they are. Oxygen, chest 100%. Yaw damper on, nav transfer. Display switches, normal auto. Fuel, 6,305 required, 6,400 on board, four pumps on. First mills on, window heat on, air command press, tracks auto, bleeds on, set, press mode selector, auto. Instruments, cross checked, auto brakes, RTO, speed brake. Down attempts, park and brake, set, step jump cutout switches, normal, 
Radius radar and transponder, set and standby, radar and aileron trims, three and zero, takeoff briefing, discussed, PA, complete, FMC, CDU, set, M1 and IS box, reduce 24K, automatic, 139, 140, 146, and set, stop trim, 6.3, set, performance weight balance, sign send, phones off, EFB, airplane mode stowed, flight windows and cockpit door, locked, doors, closed, passengers, seated, before start checklist, complete down to the line so they can remove all the equipment down here and then I would say it is about time to uh, tell them we're ready and it does not give me an option to deselect the pushback that is unfortunate because then we'll just go the easy way and bye bye gsx okay we can see from the line over here that this parking position actually is a taxi out position so we don't need pushback on this one there is unfortunately no atc online either so let's go ahead with the before start procedure MP4 start checklist below the line. Air compacts off, anti collision light on, parking brake set, transponder rolled off, B4 start checklist complete. Okay, start engine number two. And we took 23 and a half minutes. That's what I call a good turnaround. Not that you are very likely to actually see one in Italy, but you know where I'm going with this. N2, all pressure, N1. By the way, I promised you that I would have a look at a couple of the comments in the turnaround. Now, you see where those Ryanair turnarounds are going, so um, not all that much time. But I promised to uh, do that in flight then. My apologies. Start a cutout. Monitor 2. Isolating a pack. I'm starting one. And two. All press. And one. Start her cutout, monitor one, one stable. The ground gas should be gone at this moment anyway, so I'll just continue with the um, setup. Okay, flight control track. Pull up, pull down, neutral, left, right, neutral, rudders left right and neutral before taxi checklist generators on apu off start switches continuous pro beat on anti ice off air conditioning tax auto bleeds on isolation off auto flaps path required fast selected green light step trim 6.3 units required and set start leave is idly turned flight controls checked recall checked before taxi checklist complete General traffic runner 7 kilo Juliet stand 206 taxiing to runway 28 Okay, clear left and clear right. It's going to be a sharp turn to the right. Can't take. Oh. Ah, the brake was still set. Okay. That's why we do this, isn't it? So, let's try once more. 
Break us off. Config. That's better. I really like the angle at which the 737 can turn out here. I mean, just look at this. If I'm going full tiller, really easy going. Clear left, clear right. Okay, so we'll go straight ahead, all the way, Mike and Golf. So, taxi routing is understood. Let's go ahead with the before takeoff checklist. Config, check, flaps, 5, 5, green light, staff trim, 6.3, set, takeoff briefing. Right to takeoff, runway 28, flaps 5, noise abatement 2, and we have dry speeds 139, 140, 146, set. Uh, the sit straight ahead to 800 and uh, no exactly 800 feet left turn 135 intercept 180 towards Exito engine out sits straight out to one mile from Sestri then a left turn direct Exito hold 360 right turns and climbing 3000 feet any questions okay no questions cabin secure before takeoff checklist complete down to the line That's clear on the left, clear on the right. Let's see, nobody on the approach it seems. General traffic run um, 7 Lima Julia, take off runway 28. Nobody complaining either, that's good. Before takeoff checklist below the line. MCP, set, transponder, tower up, strobe lights on, landing lights on, before takeoff checklist complete. So, clear left, clear right. So we'll take as much runway as we can without having to backtrack. But of course runway that's behind you is not worth a lot. So here we go. Timing. Stabilized. So take off first. Take a first set, indications normal. Restrictions 185 in the first turn, but in order to be able to retract the flaps, I'll just about take flap one, flaps one, speed checked, flaps one.
Is that standard? Passing 3 1, climbing level 100. And here we go. Okay, the turn is complete. Fuck up. Flaps up. Speed check. Flaps up. Come on, B. Flaps up, no lights. Venus, after take up checklist. And cabin can be released. Air condition pressurization 2.4, climbing. And set, fasten bell. And altimeters. Standard, passing 55, climb 100. After tail checklist complete. We are pretty much clear of anything over the water. So let's go ahead and give ourselves a quick shortcut here. Heading select. Up to a higher level, 200 initially. And let's go direct to Amtel. That is a waypoint that the Italians apparently really like. I've been flying to Amtel so often already. Execute, enough available, Elna. So, if there's Amtel on my route, I'll fly direct there. And full climb thrust. Set. All right, and we are on the way once again. Altimeters, passing flight level 100, climbing 200, 10 checks. Fuel is balanced, 4 pumps on, the lights are off, APU off, air condition and pressurization, 4.2, climbing, and set, fasten belts, auto, recall, checked, 1 to 1.5, monitoring, 10 checks complete. Jeff, flying is so awesome, you do it on your day off. Actually, I'm not even off today, but I have to do a late evening flight today. So after the stream, I will have to go flying in real life. Magoo, Italy has some really amazing freeware sceneries. It does indeed. Even though the one we've just been flying to was from Beautiful Model of the World, so not a freeware scenery. And for Napoli, we're using RT presets, so that's not... Um, Freeware as well. Uh, Metal Eye, better wait for 737 NG driver's comment on it since he flies it every day. Okay, so what are we talking about there? Um, trying to scroll up, trying to find that. What is that thing with the display on the center panel? I'm not talking about the audio tuning panel or transponder. Okay, that thing with the display. What are we talking about then? No audio, no transponder. You mean the ADF over here? Apart from that, we also have a rudder trim indicator, should you mean that? But I find it a little bit hard to know exactly what you're talking about right now. Not 100% sure what you mean. So if you could go into a couple more um, details about that, just let me know, okay? 
Then, Stick Herald and Andreasen, which of P template and Simbrief do you find most fit for the 737? In my opinion, definitely the Reiner template. Hent Magoo, when did you get the uh, launch? Well, not at all yet. Okay, let's go climb a bit higher, all the way up to Truce, 370, which is set. 370 checked, once, twice, and three times, monitoring 11.5. Alec, any chance we'll be doing some US flights soon? I always enjoy hearing your comments on differences in ATC and flight planning. Um, yeah, I will. On the 19th, if I'm not totally mistaken, there will be a charity event going on where I will participate, flying from Cologne to Boston. So I'm, I'll be flying to uh, the US by, on that one with the BBJs across the Atlantic. Then Metal Eye, which would you recommend more to bridge till the 739 arrives? I have the Phoenix and the 736, 7 and 8. Kodiak or Honda Jet or anything else? I prefer high fidelity add-ons, not arcadey ones. Well, if you already say you prefer high fidelity over arcadey, then um, I would recommend... The Kodiak definitely is good. Now if you want something for a bit more of um, high altitude and uh, longer range flying, well, longer range than the Kodiak at least, then I could also recommend you to have a look at the uh, Analog King Air. That one's nice as well. So, yeah, probably the Analog King Air because it's just something totally different. Metalize. Some aircrafts have an ILS panel, I think, with the HUD installed. Ah, if you're talking with the HUD, then that is, uh, yeah, the HUD panel. So there can be a controller over here for the head-up display. That can definitely be installed. And then you'll have your um, secondary display up over here on the first officer's main panel where you see the active HUD modes. So the controller for the head-up display, that can be down there on the pedestal. And Eurasia, is there any event going on over Tenerife North by any chance? There's really a lot of traffic down there right now. Um, well, have a look at my.watsum.net for current events. Now, if I'm quickly having a look down there, I do not see any event over there, no. So maybe it's a group flight or something? When I'm looking at um, what's going on at Vatsim, I usually love to check where the people are from. So if we have a look into Vatsby, like this, and I'm going all the way over there, Wow, there is really a lot of traffic from there. And they're all flying to Malaga. It has to be some sort of an event. But at least there is nothing on my Watsim. So, yeah, I don't know. Just checking the event calendar one more time, but um, see all events today. No, there is definitely nothing publicly announced. So, I don't know. It has to be some sort of an event, but um, at least it's not in the Watsim event calendar. So, not sure what exactly is going on down there. But too bad it is not in the event calendar because it would surely have been interesting to fly there, actually. That's a pity. That is really a pity. Goodwin, what is the hardest landing you ever experienced and how do you know in the cockpit how hard your landing was in feet per minute? 
Uh, to be honest, we don't know how hard our landings were in feet per minute, because it just doesn't matter. Um, you feel the landing, and that's all you need. Junk pile 1986. I'm soon flying Cologne to Tenerife. Maybe with you? Uh, that depends. On what date are you flying it? Fossey, there's an around the world event that starts in Sydney, Australia and ends in Sydney, Australia. Ah, okay. Is it the world flight? Might be. Ah, yeah, it is the world flight. Okay. I wasn't aware that it's actually going on right now. So, might have to join for a lack tomorrow. A boot win. Yes, we are tracking the G-forces, but um, we only get to see our G-forces when it's actually... Um, when they were excessive, because only then we are actually going to get an email. But other than that, um, we don't have any cockpit indications for the G-forces. And um, yeah, that that's really it. So we don't really care, you know. In real life, when you do your landing, you just feel it. And that's all you need to know. You feel if it's a good landing or not. Angle of bank 10. Jeff, I'm doing a world flight like today in my buddy's full 320 home cockpit. Nice. Enjoy that one. And Junk Pile 1986, unfortunately, I don't do that flight on the 20 uh, 22nd, sorry. I, I have another flight that day. And Magoo, yeah, FPM numbers really is the ego booster of sim pilots. Oh yes, that couldn't be any more true. That literally couldn't be any more true. <laughs> Alright, so I don't really like that uh, small knick that our route is doing there. Let's go direct. Well, T bus seems nice. Let's do that. So, execute. LNAV available. LNAV. Jeff, FPM is important for sim pilots because we can't feel the landing like in real life. Yeah, I mean, that's partially true because you can still see if you had a good landing or not. I mean, you will definitely notice when you're doing an impact on that runway. Just like you will definitely notice when you're actually doing a real greaser. So, you can still see it. What I really like the landing report for in Sim Toolkit Pro is just to have a look at... Um, how good did you hit your uh, aiming point? Have you been on center line? And of course, the FPM indication is also an interesting one in that regard because it just tells you how good you actually um, touch down down there. Nathaniel, do you use FS Realistic? Normally, yes, but right now I don't have it installed because in the beta with the 737 it did cause a couple issues. However, not the autopilot issues, but it did cause a couple of um, issues with the flight controls. Now, that's why I uninstalled it back then. And um, due to the thing that I'm not allowed to mention right now, I did just yet not reinstall it, but I will very soon. So we'll just have to keep it at that. Not allowed to give details there right now. Sorry for that. My apologies.
And Jeff, well, my pleasure giving you those 737 videos. Then, Miss Flightboy05, fellow 737 and G driver, I'm trying to figure out the payload other section in the FMC. Not sure how to use it. If I'm totally honest with you, there is not really that much use in it. So, at least in my opinion. So this is what we're talking about, the other. Um, if I'm totally honest with you, in my opinion, right now there is no use in that one. The only thing that's really interesting on that is the icing over here, which tells you if your airplane is iced up without showing you, because the lovely simulator from time to time has its little quirks where it does not want to show you a icing, but nonetheless takes it into account for the aircraft performance. Then Nathaniel, when it comes to the valves, when do you open or close it, please, or an auto? Um, do you mean the outflow valve, or could you just emphasize which valve exactly you mean? Then Stick Harold Andreasen, can pilots after end route waypoints uh, can pilots alter end route waypoints to reduce flight time without asking ATC? No, not at all. Um, strict flight plan compliance is a hundred percent mandatory, so. You cannot just deviate from the filed route without talking to air traffic control. You can always ask them if there are shortcuts available, and in most cases they are going to accommodate some. So it certainly is um, permissible to get or, or to ask for shortcuts. Want to go, by the way. However, it is absolutely not permissible to alter your route without talking to air traffic control. So air traffic control really has an idea about um, where you are, what you are going to do, where you are going to be at what time. And they do plan that ahead like for a really long time in order to facilitate separation with other aircraft. So um, no, there is absolutely no way that you could deviate from your planned route without talking to ATC. Of course, if you have to deviate for whatever reason, for example, for weather reasons, then of course you can't deviate from the route, but you have to talk with air traffic control. And Nathaniel, I mean the isolation valve. Okay, so um, to summarize the question, when it comes to the isolation valve, when do you open or close it or uh, set it to auto? So let's talk about that for a second. In the meantime, con set, as we've just leveled off at our cruise level, Top of descent isn't that far away, so um, I'll make it briefly with the isolation valve. Basically, you open it whenever you're on the ground. You close it when you do isolated pack operation. So, to explain it, when the isolation valve is open, then air can flow from the left side into the right side of the system and the other way around, from the right into the left side. So, on the ground, you have it open because the only source of air that you are going to have is going to be your um, either APU bleed or the um, external air conditioning which in both cases are um, connected to the left side except for the air conditioning that um, is going directly into the mix manifold however when the APU bleed is on you want that isolation valve open now If you have started the right engine using APU bleed and it is really hot outside, then you can close the isolation valve, which then enables you to turn on the right pack so that the right engine is going to bring air to the right pack and therefore provide air conditioning to the cabin while you are starting the left hand engine. Because then you have APU bleed only going to the left side and the isolation valve isolates the right side so that the right engine can bring air to the right pack. Another condition in which you would close the isolation valve, mostly in flight, is when you have a fire and when there is a smoke or fumes entering either side of the system. Then closing the isolation valve might provide um, a relief for you as well. Finally, for the rest of the time the valve is going to be in auto, 
and basically when the valve is in auto and the engine bleeds are on and the packs in auto then the isolation valve is going to be closed but when any of these switches is moved to the off position so either pack or either bleed is going is a move to the off position then the isolation valve would automatically open while the switch is in the auto position. So that's like the um, easiest explanation of how the isolation valve works exactly. All right, so with that said and done, Metal Eye, thank you so much for the 1199 donation there. Thank you so much. And be sure to give that King Air a try. You are going to love it if you love complex aircraft. Uh, Kuni08, is there a hot start simulated? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I need to try to actually force one. But I, to be honest, I don't think Microsoft Flight Simulator supports those. Then, Flying Hazard, do you ever do packs off takeoffs? Um, only when required for performance reasons. So, for example, if you're in Rome Ciampino and it's really hot summer, you only have a 2,000 meter runway, that might be a point where you have to do a pack off takeoff. But even then, we wouldn't do a packs off takeoff, but we would do a no engine bleed takeoff. So we would put the bleeds off, but the APU would still be providing air to the packs so that the cabin would pressurize. So, in a 737, you don't really talk about a PAX off takeoff, but you would talk about either a no engine bleed takeoff, which would be the default option, or about uh, unpressurized takeoff. Now, that is the closest it comes to the uh, PAX off equivalent from the Airbus side of life. So, the unpressurized takeoff would be the um, closest equivalent. However, we don't do unpressurized takeoffs. So, a uh, no engine bleed takeoff would be the um, option of choice. Now, that might actually be a very good idea to cover in a separate video. So, let me quickly write that down so that I can uh, do a future video about that uh, particular topic. All right, I wrote it down and I'll cover it in a future video, promised. And Nathaniel, also please, with the PMDG, I'm having an issue where after I land, I want to do a return and I put all the weight and balance and calculate the V-speeds, but I don't see it on the FMC. Well, you can see I'm, that at least I'm doing turnarounds all the time in the PMDG and I don't have that issue, so I guess you haven't executed the um, route or the performance. So that's my main ideas here, that something is not executed in the FMC. Apart from that, if you still encounter the issue, I would recommend to contact the PNG support directly because they should be able to give you a little bit um, further help with that kind of issue. Alrighty, so we'll start our approach preparation in a few moments here. Stand by for that. I'll just take a quick break of one minute and then I'll be straight back with you guys. So in a minute we'll start our approach preparations.
All right, I'm back. So let's have a look into our arrival into uh, Napoli. So the latest weather, as far as I can see, favors runway 24. So we'll definitely go for that one. Let's quickly do some FMS programming here. So transition 8000. And we are looking at um, weather conditions in Napoli. Currently 2204, few clouds 3000, 20 degrees 1021. So 1021 is going to be our QNH that results in a transition level of uh, 90. So let's put that one in. Also looking at uh, Sim Toolkit Pro real quick for the descent winds here. So, 310-200-100. And overall we're looking at 278 at 17. Then 291 at 15. And finally, 293 at 7. Alright, landing runway is going to be 24. And we'll have a 111 mile ring from a 3 times the cruise level, a 10 mile ring, and a 4 mile ring. So that should pretty much be our setup completed. Let's see in here, we have lots of um, speed and altitude restrictions, so I don't see any reason to insert anything new. In that case, we need the courses, 2, 3, 5. The frequency is 109.5 on both sides. And the minimum is going to be 540. Here we go. Okay, reset MCP alt. So down we go. Let's start with level 250 initially. Actually, let's get all, all the way level 150. Here we go. Set 150 check. Let's quickly monitor how well the uh, autopilot is going to start our descent. And let's keep an eye on the auto throttle to see if we are able to recreate the auto throttle bug now. Uh, CUNY80, a question. At the, during the engine start, the EGT starts at 200 degrees. Is that normal? Well, certainly if... Um, you are doing a turnaround it is normal or if you're picking up an airplane that has flown before because everything in the engine is still going to be um, everything in the engine is still going to be hot and therefore heat up the air inside the engines themselves okay so nice start of the descent there nothing to complain about let's do a quick approach briefing so that we have everything done we have 200 knots at Bento as the next speed restriction. Forecast page is filled in. Fixed range runway 24, 10 miles, 4 miles. The arrival itself is gonna go from Teano to 27 miles outbound. So we have Teano, Teano 27 on a 103 course. Then towards Agoti, right turn to Bento, 200 knots and Battle 70. Let's see where those 200 knots come from. Probably on the ILS chart. So ILS Zulu runway 24, 11-3. We have Bento. Yeah, here. Yeah, maximum 200 knots and above 7,000 feet. We go on towards Ramia November 714, max 185, above 5,200 feet. And then towards Ubrook, max 185 knots as well. From there, we join the final approach. Uh, the FAF is at 5.6 miles, 2,200 feet, which is the Fox India 24 Zulu. 
2200 that's in 3.3 degree light so configuring the airplane is going to be a little bit of a thing since the approach is a little bit steeper than usual going down to the minimum of 540 which we have in here missed approach Continue Roma heading climbing 5000 at 750 turn left marks 185 Romeo November 706 so that is what we have in here 750 waypoint 706 turn left maximum 185 knots that's in towards Romeo November 711 then to Oliva to Ischia and hold and climbing 5000 feet we have that in here I'm wondering uh, the 200 knot restriction comes from the uh, maximum holding speed but that's not going to be an issue we'll ask ATC for relief and we are going to retract the flaps anyway okay so frequencies 109.5 set active both sides course is 235 active both sides minimum um, 540 active on both sides and the field elevation According to the chart, 294, we have 300 in here, that is good enough for me. Oops, wrong button. Here we go, that's better. Okay, so fuel on the arrival. Required 3.2 for diversion towards Roma, which is just off the right hand side here, so that is observed cuff K okay for the weather. Arrival fuel 3.9, giving us 15 minutes extra. We're now burning 300 kilos, which is a landing weight of 62.3. So 62.3, let's do a little bit of mathematics. Landing Napoli. Runway 24 with a cat 1, let's calculate 5%. Conditions dry, the wind in the worst case is going to be 180 at 4. Temperature 20, QNH 1021. Flaps 30, landing weight we said is going to be 62.3. 5 knots VRF addition, calculate. 50 minute brake cooling, that is excessive. Let's take the reverse operational then. So 2200 meters, 16 minute brake cooling. That does look uh, pretty decent to me. So flaps 30, auto brake 3 once again. And using that, we'll vacate the runway. Most likely via Bravo Charlie, maybe via Bravo as well. And we're going to park on uh, somewhere over here 17, 18, 19, 20, something like that. Have any questions on the briefing? No, very good. Then let's do the descent checklist. Pressurization, land out 300. Any eyes off? Throat break fuel discussed. He has an outbox. You can pre select the QA. And apart from that, check and set. Descent checklist complete. Alright, so that's the approach preparation complete. Uh, Nathaniel, is the performance calculator available for purchase? Yes, it is on virtualperformancetool.com. Then, DECXL, how can I convert to feet the descent rate in percent? Um, divided by 5, multiplied times 3. I believe that is the correct formula. So, yeah, divide by 5, multiply with 3. Ufran, hi, nice to see you. Right, let's just quickly do something because mainly I want to see if it even works in the PMDG. So let's see how quick we could actually... yeah it does work, very good. So I'm just entering an RTA over here to see how much we could gain by um, 
flying faster. So having a look into here, we can see that the first possible time we could be there is at 1456, the latest possible time at 1510. Now, if we look into the FMC, we can see that using Cost NX6, we'll be there at 59. So we would be able to make good about three minutes time if we just went all the way up to the red line. Now, that is what I meant during the earlier live stream, so during the earlier sector in this one, I mean. Um, of course, we could fly the airplane much faster at 300 knots or something, but we would burn a lot more fuel and we would save maybe three minutes, according to the airplane over here. So, um, that's what we can see on the RTA page over here. Now, of course, I could tell it like I want to be there at that, that time. So, if I would say, for example, RTA 1501. Then the airplane would now start reducing its airspeed. Like you can see it over here, the required speed would be 239 knots. So if I executed that, it would slow down 239 knots and then we would get there at the time required. But for now, shouldn't be much of an issue. So I'm just going to erase all of that. But um, yeah, that's how you see how that stuff would work. Uni80, thank you very much for the 5 euro donation. And it's a pleasure doing those streams for you guys. Then Eurosha. By the way, Captain, I finally convinced myself, thanks to your videos, to fly on a network, and in the last week I've had my first ever flights on VATSIM. It really is a beautiful and different experience. My, ple my pleasure, Eurasia. Going online is really the uh, biggest change to my flight simulator experience so far. It really took it forward to a whole different level there. And yeah, really my pleasure doing that. Thank you so much once again for the donation. And um, as always, if you think there is any topic that should be covered that I haven't covered yet, everyone is welcome to put the suggestions into the um, either the comments here or the um, comments underneath any of the videos. And you can be assured I am reading them. Of course, you could also join my... Um, Discord channel and even though I am recently not all that active in there which is partially due to the fact that I'm just flying so much in real life you can be assured that um, eventually I will hopefully read everything in there as well and Ufran how can I get the clock to show hours and minutes mine always shows the second and minutes which causes me to lose track of flight time um, that's the difference between using the chronometer and using the elapsed timer. So, if I'm clicking the clock button up here, then that is going to show minutes and seconds. Uh, sorry, hours, minutes, and then the seconds up here. Now, the elapsed timer is always going to show you hours and minutes. And let's think about, is there any way to actually get it to minutes and seconds? Well. Only if you do it like this, if you use the chrono function. I guess that is um, what you're doing. I guess you're using the chrono function, which is just giving you this. Now, if you use the elapsed timer down here, that one, that is basically giving you the uh, flight time like this in um, hours and minutes at all times. So, for takeoff, we use both. We don't have to. Officially, it's just the elapsed timer. But personally, I like the chrono as well because it shows me how um, long I ran the engines at takeoff power already. So that's what I use the chrono for. And then I reset that one when the thrust changes to climb thrust up here. And the elapsed timer 
I start as well because that is giving me my flight time in hours and minutes which is probably what your question was I guess no can't really reset the view very well still have to work on a button that resets me to the first officer view by standard because for some reason it always wants to go to the captain's view well for some reason because I'm manually shifting it around so it does what it's supposed to do it's just not exactly what I wanted to do yet uh, Magu, guess you're not allowed to tell us where you'll be flying later on well I'm, I'm thinking about my company's social media policy right now and if I'm totally honest, I wouldn't know exactly what would forbid me to tell you. So yeah, I'll be flying to Rome, Fiumicino. Alessandro and Coda 101, you can change to a camera pilot, select co-pilot. Okay, let's try that real quick. Let's go back to the captain's seat, then camera... Pilot. I don't even have co-pilot in here. Oh, yes I do. I'm just blind. That works indeed. Man, thank you. <laughs> you always learn something new, right? But that works indeed. Thank you so much. Okay, fast melts on. Let's go further down. But that view is not like 100% correct. A little bit low. Let's see what I get if I change that back. Because that is my default view. And then I just go over. That looks a little bit more correct, if I'm honest. I might just about have to file a bug report with PMDG there, about the co-pilot view not being 100% accurate. Well, well, always keep finding those bugs, right? Okay, I'm sorry for being quiet for a little time. I was just looking at the um, auto thrust a bit and checking something in the beta forum because I wanted to try some more cases in which I could actually um, replicate that thrust bug because it still kind of triggers me. I want to fix that one or, well, first of all, I want to trigger that one in order to uh, find some more re reproducible cases. But I really don't see how I could trigger that right now. So at least on my own stream, it was just fly the normal approach and then it would come. But, well.
Okay, someone's located the wrong way, that's fine. Uh, Stick Harold Andreasen, thank you so much for the 22 NOK donation. And is Sim Toolkit Pro VR friendly? Um, well, Sim Toolkit Pro doesn't run inside the um, simulator, so I guess it's not. And Stefan, sorry, I missed your question about the time limit for running the engines at takeoff thrust a few times. But um, the time limit is five minutes. After five minutes, you have to go to max continuous thrust. And Magoo, yeah, people can find out which flight it is, that's true, but to be honest, Fine with me. After all, those sitting inside the airplane will also find out that I'm flying. And nope, definitely no 25 minute turnaround then. That is absolutely right. <laughs> and Alessandro, by default I didn't change any settings on pilot's view height, but you know, um, in some cases I did play around with it and I found it rather difficult to achieve like the 100% exact viewpoint that you're supposed to have. That, by the way, goes for a lot of different um, flight simulator aircraft. So it's not just the 737. I have the same problem in the A320. And I guess the primary reason for having those problems is that in real life, when you're looking around, the position of your eyes actually changes when you move your head. And therefore, things just look different in real life because in the simulator, your eyes are bound to a certain position. And if you're looking around, then your eyes aren't moving its actual position. Because in real life, it's your neck that's keeping a constant um, position. Versus in the simulator, it's the eyes. So that's creating a bit of a problem there. Okay, set altimeter 1021, passing 8300, descending 7000, no flex, done by set. If we're getting a bit high, let me update that direct towards our doty. Then the VNAV is gonna recalculate with the current winds. And 500 feet high. Yeah, that's fine. Let's use the speed brake to lose that speed because we can see here that we would overshoot the turn towards Bento. So I'm gonna use the speed brake a bit to help it with the deceleration. And we can also do the ten checks real quick. So fuel balance, four pumps, lights on, back twenty-five, air compress, three no two eighty sending set, fast mode on, recall check, twenty-one point five deselected, ten checks complete. Alright, and here we go. Now we can make the turn towards Bento, as we can see by the line connecting again. So let's do a frisk. Frequencies 109.5, active both sides. Rings, runway 24104, IDENS, India, November, Papalina, on both sides, temper instrument set, corset 235, approach checklist. Altimeter and instruments, cross checked, approach rates checked and set, approach checklist completed. Flaps 1, speed checked. But look at that, the auto throttle is really behaving today. I can't tell you why, I really can't. The only thing I can tell you is that today it's really doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, approach mod arms, wall are captured, runway heading 235, and we have glide stop captured. 
That is 5,000 feet for the missed approach. That. Plus 5. Speed checked. Plus 5. Of course, we have the sun right in front of us. Okay, someone's departing from Rome 24, but we're far enough out. Won't be a problem. Let's turn those lights on. They look so pretty. So speed limit 185 knots, we have that, ground speed's looking good as well, calm winds, what else could you ask for? Right, looks like we can't get the auto throttle to act up. So in that case, let's go in and enjoy a little bit of hand flying. Very noted. And eventually we have to get rid of the sunshade. Officially we're not supposed to land with the sunshade attached. Gear down, flip 15. And the landing checklist. Down switches, continuous, recall, check, speed brake, on green light, landing gear, down free green, auto brake, reset, flip steady, speed check, flip steady. Flaps. 
30, 30 green lights. And it does certainly help if you do your hand flying as a priority. That's so much easier in real life when you have a proper pilot monitoring. 1,000. Checked. And the landing lights are on. Landing check is complete. Five and a continue. Continue. Going below the glide intentionally. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. You pick up, thruster is normal. 80% 100 knots 80 knots Manual brakes Auto brakes disarm And it's gonna be short way in starting the APU No, that doesn't really look right. Let's try one more time. Parking. 19. No follow me required. Thank you so much. And handling by Menzies. So, time to do a quick cleanup. Okay, 19, here we are. Nobody here. That looks just like in real life. Of course, without a marshal, we would not even have parked on the gate here, but you know, for flight sending purposes, that is fine with me. Come on, I need to hit that brake, here we go. And we have two blues, one red, engine's dead. Having true doctor manual and cross check. Okay, that is pretty much gonna be it for today. So, let's see how good or uh, how not so good that one actually went out. We'll have a look into the landing report in a few moments. In the meantime, I'm just quickly going to run the uh, shutdown procedures. And as soon as the plane is shut down, 
into one and two below 20. So let's see if you she are is. currently parked at the wrong parking position. What do you mean? I selected number 19, didn't I? Well, looks like it doesn't even want to recognize me. Parked anywhere. What does that look like? We are in 19, that's for sure. Okay, no idea. GSX is messing up. I don't even want to know. You are currently parked at the wrong parking yes, position. Yes, thank you. Restart quarter. Bye bye. Okay, shotgun checklist. Fuel pumps, one on. Electrical, APU, fast melts off, window heat off, probe heat auto, anti ice off, electric hydraulic pumps off, voice recorder auto, aircon packs off, engine bleeds on, apple bleed off, exterior lights steady, star switches off, auto brake off, uh, speed brake down return, flaps up in the light, parking brake set, start label cut off, weather radar off, transponder 2000 standby, CB has to be in, cockpit door unlocked. Shutdown checklist complete. Alright, so now comes the uh, big task, finding out how good or not that landing was. I have to admit, the landing was a little bit of a challenge, because the glide slope just brought us in hopelessly too high. So it wasn't all that easy to uh, bring the thing down. But, overall, 127 feet a minute, one marker behind the aiming point. But seeing that we crossed the threshold quite a bit too high, in my opinion, because of that lovely, awful glide slope, I would say that is quite an acceptable result down here. Alright, so, for now, thank you very much for watching, everyone. I hope you've had as much fun as I did. Now, I'm going to shut this airplane down. We'll just assume deboarding is complete. And... Uh, that is pretty much going to be it for today's live stream then. Now, I'll go and have some fun, fun with the real airplane. And um, overall, I hope to see you again in the next couple of days. From tomorrow, I have four days off. So, I will be able to do a couple more videos. Until then, thank you very much for watching, everyone. And finally, Yurusha, the application's name is Sim Toolkit Pro. So, thank you very much, and bye-bye.